Man, I can was that Woolworths. Although it was actually Wanamaker's. At the time. Yeah. But I think that I think that's supposed to be a joke. It's all a joke. <laughs> Wing is the opening song today. It's the Bennington Show. A lot of people are just uh, showing us pictures that say the word Bennington on it from different places. If they see a Bennington sign, yeah, some sort of a store that is Bennington, a by book. Way, Joe's in the room. You almost seriously got your neck run by Chris. He was going crazy yelling at you. Really? Screaming. Yes. He wanted to switch out with you. Oh. And you were just giving him either a thumbs up or an okay <laughs> sign. And he was... Getting fucking Rumpelstiltskin pissed. I can't hear you, Chris. <laughs> don't you know this sign? I don't know. Switch out. He Chris, said that it did. Chris goes, this means switch out. And I'm like, something tells me this has never been established. Just now it decided that. And then earlier you were trying to, he was trying to get your attention and then he just kept smacking his ear <laughs> yeah. as hard as he could. He said, Talk to me. This meant repeat for some reason was hitting himself in the ear. I want you guys to work on a language. Yeah, I think I'm pretty communicative with him, mm -hmm. except for that word right there. <laughs> but other than that, I can't, you know. No, 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 no. You, you're you not connected with him at all. Now, look how different Chris looks. He looks younger. <laughs> oh, he looks he great looks, in there. Yeah. Chris, you look so healthy. <laughs> uh, look, you don't even know how to turn on the thing. No, he doesn't. Yeah. He didn't say anything that we could hear. No, 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 no you don't know how to do it. You don't know how to turn <laughs> on the mic. Put up the fader. No. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> oh, man, that's really bad. That's really bad <laughs> that it took you that long. Well, Chris had something he wanted to start the show off with, but he's out. No, he's so gone. So you have something you wanted to talk about, Gail. I do. Uh, have you seen this video of the baby who is floating in the swimming pool that is making everyone on the Internet go absolutely They're insane. furious that a baby is floating infuriated by and it. you see that the family is right there no one has taken this baby tied it to a brick and chucked it in the pool they're letting it float but this baby is as uncomfortable in a pool as anyone i've ever seen now what i like there start it face down switched over so she could breathe she figured it out so this is, you know, the the family has decided they they wanted the baby to know that you if got you, a pool. If you, yeah, if you have a pool, it's best to say, oh, if you fall in this pool, can your baby save her own life? And she knows how to do it. And it's it's difficult to watch because there's definitely uncomfortability. Like she's not thrilled that she has to be like paddling with her little feet well, and trying not, to keep her face. I up. mean, I don't know how she would look happy. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's in the same way. But she must be like a little airy fat baby to be able to float <laughs> like that. Like she's not doing a lot of work there. No. And she's just floating like she was laying down in the living room. But when this video blew up, of course, I had to look at all the comments. Yeah. And like, you know, at least half, if not more, are like, your child should be taken away from you. Yes. You should not be allowed to breed. What about yeah. the parents of the Nirvana baby? Uh, never mind. Well, that baby was just going after a dollar on a hook. Yeah. And anybody would do that. Everyone knows that's how you teach your baby how but to swim. But that was a real baby and a real baby swimming. Yes. And the babies can naturally swim. Yes. If you start right away. That wasn't any kind of Photoshop. That was a baby swimming underwater. What? Yeah. How do you not know the babies no can swim? Yeah. Well, I knew they could hold their breath, but swim and paddle? Yes. I know. You're seeing it right there, Joe. <laughs> There's a baby, That's a real laying baby. on its chubby fat back <laughs> with its fat thighs, and you couldn't push it underwater without it bouncing back up. Now go back again to just watch how the baby finds her way around. It's pretty impressive. She goes face first. Yeah, she's hilarious. And then she just yeah. wiggles her way <laughs> until she's right side up. And then just I'm slowly to say, kicking. I'm willing to say it's the only thing this dumb baby can do. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is not a baby that can walk. This Vito, is don't forget all your uh, your things that you've got to do in there with the phones and stuff like that. You're a producer, not just the guy watching a baby <laughs> swim. <laughs> oh my god. 844 Rock God. 844 Rock God. 
Now, do you even remember a time when you couldn't swim, Gail? No, I I learned very young. I don't believe that I learned no. as an infant, no. but um, because you know I grew up in Florida, everyone had pools, everyone was always at the beach. Right. Um, it was it's pretty important to make sure that your kids learn to swim right away and boogie board because <laughs> right. That board can take off with them, and it's really funny to see them holding on. <laughs> the baby! <laughs> no, you just run next to the baby. <laughs> um, but uh, here's a Mike, Mike in uh, Texas. Hey, Mike. Yeah, Ron, I just wanted to say this baby in the pool, y'all are talking about, that's the technique that is taught to save infants from drowning. It's not something specific to this family. It's People yeah, take classes for that. Yeah, we know. And there are people that <coughs> have their baby in a, a bathtub. Uh, a, a, a baby is ready to swim. Two things that a baby can do. Swim yeah. and parachute. Yeah. And no one's w- willing to believe <laughs> wow. that a baby knows how just to float <laughs> down to the earth. They're really good at it. Yeah. It's uh, instinct. The human body is incredible. All right. Tommy Jonigan says it's so hard to watch the baby. The, the family had a son that drowned and they're trying to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Well, yeah, in any place, California, Florida, even the suburbs, anywhere, there's a lot of swimming pools. You got to be incredibly, even if you teach the baby to swim, you still got to be right there, right. like a foot away. Like, if the baby does fall in the pool, I don't think anyone's going to be like, oh, she's fine. <laughs> she's got this. Right. Let's go in and make a sandwich. Mike, Mike in North Carolina. Hey, Ron. Um, let me turn on my radio. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, Either that or turn I it just, up. <laughs> okay. I just thought I would uh, throw out there for, I don't think this will get everyone's attention, but there's probably a few of your listeners who might put it together that the reason the baby can swim so well is because it spent its lifetime learning how to swim, albeit nine months, and there is your answer to why abortion is uh, not a good thing. Let's just just be honest. It didn't learn to swim. It floated. You know what I mean? Um, there was no, okay, now there's going to be swimming lessons. You're just floating around in there. Right. And I'm pretty sure amniotic fluid is different than water. I mean, it's, I uh... don't go underwater with it. It burns my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievably. But you could breathe it in. Yeah. Can you? Um, I wouldn't. <laughs> what was it? Did you ever see that movie? I think. The Abyss? The Abyss. Yeah. Where you breathe in that pink. Jello stuff, and, yeah, and it was said you could breathe in it. Yeah, and it was supposed to be like amniotic fluid, but when it filled, the suit filled up. His, you know, it still hurt because it yeah. felt like drowning. But then eventually, you get used to it. But it filled up his lungs. Yeah, not just his throat. Yeah, filled up the lungs. So, I've been just doing that with phlegm, and it feels great. <laughs> um, Josh, Josh in South Carolina. Hey, what's up, buddy? Hey, man. Yeah. The dude would be rolling in his grave right now. Have you ever seen the, it's like a 20 second video of John Wayne throwing a kid into the river who said he couldn't swim? No. That's fantastic. Now, said, this, I know how to was this in a movie? Swim. Was this in a movie or a? I'm sure, but. Yeah, I'm favorite. sure that the Duke just didn't chuck somebody, <laughs> you know, into the river. He does what he wants, the Duke. Yeah, he does. <laughs> Hell of a. Fucking filmography. John Wayne. Big, loud sissy that he was. John Wayne. Um, Here's Mike. Georgia Mike, how are you? Hey, what's going on, man? Can... Hey, man. Um, on a Blue Lagoon, if you remember, she uh, her baby was swimming damn near the whole movie. Well, Blue Lagoon was not uh, reality. It was a documentary, actually. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> it was like Truman Show. Like, they had just set up cameras, and they were like, let's see these children survive. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. Chris and fucking Vito just split, and I did not. <laughs> oh, my took, God. It took me a little while to figure out. <laughs> I was like, why does Vito look different? You don't know how much you two assholes look the same. It's frightening. <laughs> 
Especially right now because I don't have a dad shirt on. I just got. I have to do laundry. Look at this shit. Yeah, this is your old school look. <laughs> it's old school, Chris. Now this is. I'm gonna fucking just take a picture of this and go look how much a decade can beat a person down. <laughs> 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 Let's get a picture of you two together today. It doesn't have to be right now. Uh, Jesus Christ, dude. Relax. <clears throat> what do you think this means, Chris? I mean, swap out. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it meant come at me, bro. <laughs> oh, oh, really? Because what about the fucking text I just noticed it? something. He's wearing a black t shirt, though. Yeah, we oh, called man. each other last night. Black t shirt gang. <clears throat> this t shirt's dark blue. Yours is just older. <laughs> Faded. Fade it like your career in life. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um Jay, Florida, what's up, buddy? Hey, Ben. Yeah. Uh I was gonna say swimming's actually a natural human <laughs> instinct and due Not for Chris Stanley. Nope. Due to the socialization process, when you actually learn it, you actually don't learn it early enough. You actually were it creates a primal fear within your brain and it actually causes your body to freeze <laughs> inhibiting your actual natural instincts. Well, Chris, do you have a primal fear of drowning? Are you worried about falling in the water? Yo, God, yes. Yeah, it's just swallowing all that seawater? Fuck that. Or pool water or lake water. <laughs> Either or, yeah, okay. <laughs> what I want you to do, this summer, we're yep. going to go up to Lake George Cool. I'm going to take the fucking boat out with you in it. Okay. Uh, we're going to fish a little bit, and I want you to say the Hail Mary while I sit behind you. <laughs> sounds pretty, I'm going to have to learn the Hail Mary, but it sounds pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, I'll be I'll be laughing while I'm shooting you in the back of the head. Shooting the back of the head. <laughs> um, here is uh, here's, uh, our old buddy, the G-Man. Hey, G-Man. Hi, buddies. Hey, buddy. Ronnie B, I didn't even notice a baby in that thing. I can't get far enough to where I can stop staring at that chick's tits sitting poolside. Oh, I didn't even what? notice. Let's say I didn't notice. I was looking at the baby. I was so focused on the floating baby. That woman? Yes, that's what you would call average breasts for yes. an adult woman. Yes, that woman does have breasts. <laughs> yes, and that's it. There's nothing eye-catching <laughs> about the breasts. I mean, I. Kind you of can nice. say, look at the knees on her. <laughs> Sorry, nice knees. <laughs> look at that baby go. Uh, hey, uh, Dave Columbus. What's up, buddy? Hey, what's up? Hey, what if the baby's born in the middle of the Sahara Desert where water's not an issue? What are you talking about? Mm-hmm. About the swimming instinct. Yes, you would have an instinct, just like if the baby was born in space. An instinct doesn't fucking go away because you drive something into a desert. You know what I mean? No, I I just mean the whole heredity. People, you know, grown up there. Yes, they can fucking swim. Chris Stanley should be able to swim as well. I certainly know that he can float. I know it. You, I think Chris could do exactly what this baby. I know you're he could. just as good as this baby, Chris. Thanks, guys. I'd be hitting him with a boat paddle, trying to get him underwater. <laughs> <laughs> and then people will come out and say, "Your producer should be taken away from you. You good. don't deserve yeah, a you're producer." Right. <laughs> Peep, the amount of people on the internet who are ready to take away someone's baby. Oh yeah. If they're fucking hunting, if they're skiing. If they're climbing trees, they just want to take away the baby. People think they know best. And people who you know aren't parents saying this is bad parenting all the time. They're very quick to to judge. If you have a pool, the baby should know how to swim. That's it. And if you live next to somebody with a pool, baby should know how to swim. Also, you can see when he picks up the baby out of the water, it's not like she's in a full-on panic attack. She yeah. seems very calm. By the way, I wish we would go back to calling a pool a cement pool. So (laughs) I wish we'd go all back in that direction. Chris, you had a uh, baby story you wanted to bring up today. So it just it just became illegal in New York for a bartender to refuse a pregnant woman at a bar because now it's labeled discrimination. Yes, I don't think a bartender can refuse anyone that's over twenty one years old anything. Apparently, bartenders have been bartenders. Bartenders. I don't believe I've a never bar- seen one. I was gonna say I've I've worked in bars and restaurants. I have never seen a bartender turn down 
a woman for a drink when they saw that she was visibly pregnant. I hate when the law tries to give a bartender some extra responsibility. Like, you should be flagging someone who's too drunk. What am I, a fucking drug and alcohol counselor or a bartender? Yeah, this is my, this is what I'm, I'm just getting people drinks. Should a fucking waiter not bring an overweight person a dessert? You know? Yeah. Mm-mm. Not with that diabetic foot you've got going. And in some states, I think uh, the the bartender or server is uh, responsible for paying whatever fine that happens if they serve somebody who's under 21 as opposed to the restaurant. So that yes. particular individual would yes, then be... If, or if they turn around and get in an accident, that person can be held. Yeah. And you're like, get the fuck out of here. Stop being stupid. First of all, a lot of times when you're a bartender, you don't even see the person. They're on the other side of the, you know, right. they pop up to your bar, ask for two drinks, and then head back to the other side of the bar. Not everybody bellies up like Chris Stanley Mm-mm. just sits there and stares <laughs> in the bottom of a fucking whiskey glass like there was going to be an answer to life there. One day. When I worked in a bar, I, I know that I have served pregnant women drinks because a lot of times that a pregnant woman would come in and say that she's trying to induce labor and she would have a glass of wine. It was very common. I used to work in an Italian restaurant. It was very common that they're like, oh, I need I need to have this baby. I'm going to tell you some truth. spicy food. And I saw bars closed, right? A fucking pregnant lady do a rail and the dude that she was with was a cop, right? What? Yeah. So I was like, she shouldn't be doing that fucking row. She was giving the baby up for adoption. I'm looking over. I'm like, what's this got to fucking do with me? This doesn't have <laughs> shit to do with me. I'm not going to go over and tell everybody else how to live their life. You can't be part of that. What is this? The internet? Yeah. <laughs> this is real life. <laughs> this is real life. It'll be awkward if I go over there. So I'm telling her and this fucking crazy cop motherfucker that she's with. Now, if I could have some sort of a made up name. Yeah. And, uh, excuse me, I know you're blowing bad lieutenant, but, uh, I want to tell you a little something. Wait, you should stick to key bumps, lay off the rails. First of all, Chris, stop acting like you're so fucking knowledgeable because you came up with key bumps. Yeah, and all also, right? like, how many times a day does he say key Constantly. bumps? Constantly. All Fun the work. time. Motherfucker doesn't even have a key. Doesn't know how to drive a fucking car. How's he going to do a key bump? He had a key. He had someone else's key copied for key bumps. <laughs> It's my key bump key. Does, I don't know when it opens. This is bumpy. Doing bumpy. To his fucking mailbox. <laughs> He's doing bumps with mailbox key. <laughs> you know what? I'm fucking throwing you in the East River. No! I bet you'll fucking swim by the time you get underneath the Manhattan Bridge. I'm gonna fucking sink, dude. It's over for me. Just roll on your back. Just roll like, like the baby did. Like a fucking egg rolling over. Just Just kick your chubby little leg. Uh, (laughs) Sorry about the baby. You're already in a fucking onesie. (laughs) (laughs) Keep up, right? (laughs) Keep up. Get it? There he goes. I guess you guys are going to start calling me keep up. (laughs) Nope, we're not. (laughs) No. (laughs) Hey, buddy. It's KB. Listen. (laughs) (laughs) I got a new bit I'm working on called K-pop. You're so fucking annoying, Chris. You know what? I don't want to be. You're making up fucking hand signals that don't exist to the outside world. This motherfucker Joe had a tech. Oh, he doesn't fuck mothers. Come on. Come on, Chris. He's a person. He's not. You know what? He's from Minnesota. He's far away from home. He's trying to make friends. Yeah, man. He's not doing a good job. No. No, you're right about that. (laughs) All of his friends are from fucking Minnesota. Dude, I know. I know. You're fucking (laughs) preaching to the choir. You don't have to scream that shit at me. I'm with you and the kickball team 100%. I'm not with that loser-ass kickball team. Look, fucking Chris hangs out with the kickball team from here, right? (laughs) We're 0-4, getting our ass beat by a fucking yogurt shop the other day. That's a no know. wait, hold on. It's frozen yogurt, oh. so it's not you know. Yeah. It's still kind of cold. Just, Sounds yeah. nice. Flavors and whatnot, and whatnot. Oh, God, flavors oh, is plenty. Not toppings. So anyway, yeah, they all we stink. Flavor. Yeah, we're terrible at kickball. It's really pathetic. Let's end the fucking team then. I'm fine with that. Who's the captain of the team? Zito? No, it's uh, this, this girl Jess who works in programming. I don't know her. I don't think do I. I didn't know her before uh, I was contemplating joining the team as well. All right, let's get her ass down here. I'd like to fucking find out what's going wrong here. Yeah. So, Chris, you want the bartenders to stop pregnant women from drinking? Yeah, I don't think they should be uh, 
P- pouring booze down pregnant ladies' uh, <laughs> They're not forcing them to drink. <laughs> this is what happens. He reads an article. He reads about two sentences. They shouldn't uh, make bartenders force free pregnant women booze. You know what I mean? I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just fucking just tell you something about this fucking moron over here. Come on. He thinks he's Ted Cruz the way he wants to go around telling pregnant women how to act. <laughs> Well, I was a cruise boy before, uh, you know, he dropped out. Uh, BJ says, keep on, sir, for the poor people. U.S. wealthy use the $20 bill shovel. Um, Queen Elizabeth says, please, no one stop the Stanley Cup from having a couple of drinks before their arrival of their precious bundle. Guess what? My jizz doesn't work. You know what? I was thinking about this. uh, I was thinking about Queen Elizabeth. When this movie that we saw, and we're having the people come by later today. Yeah, Love and Friendship. Um, yeah, because she is, she, well, she's an Anglophile. She is an Anglophile, and this film is about that time of England when all you downtown Abbey people yes. love so much because there's carriages and there's a horseman and there's a giant farmhouse. It's and, uh, adapted from a Jane Austen. Yeah. And it's Whit, Whit Stillman uh, directed it. He's and, great, and by he's, the way. He's so Every cool. fucking movie he makes, I love. And the beautiful and very cool Chloe Sevigny. Incredibly also... sexy all the time. Yeah. All the time she's sexy. What was her, was Kids her first movie? Was she in Kids? That was her first yeah. role. Yeah. And then she ended up with uh, Whit. She's been with him forever. And Kate Beckinsale has been with Whit forever. And she is so fucking gorgeous in this movie she's so and she's so funny she's she's legitimately she's funny yeah um it's it's really good by the way she was just in the news the other day because she and sarah silverman were glad to see each other and sarah's with her ex-husband mm-hmm. i'm like why wouldn't people be that way you know why why do people think it's so shocking that two people who were with, who had been with the same person at different times get along you would think they would have a lot in common. Yeah, I yeah. think I think that's a very strange thing when it's the opposite, where people will say, like, who oh, is this going to be awkward? Right. It's like, well, no, like, I liked that person. This right. person liked this person. You probably would be. Fr- it's like saying, oh, is it awkward when your friend has their other friend around? Right. You're like, They're both going to be at this guy's funeral. Right. What's his <laughs> name, by the way, too? He's uh, Michael something. He's great. Great actor. Michael Sheen. Yeah, he's terrific. Mm-hmm. And in his life, had these two incredible women. Ready to go, Michael Sheen. You did it. You're the yeah. man, dude. You're the man now, dog. <laughs> That's what I would say. I would say somewhere. <laughs> Don't forget it, too, because you, you might see him. You never know. People really lost their shit over that phrase from that fucking movie. Yeah, I know they did. They really liked it. They all started doing key bumps. Is that right? Uh-huh. That's what I heard. I don't know. I, you know what uh, everybody's talking about today, too, and Chris sent this in. About the chick from the Big Bang Theory is getting divorced. She's the blonde, right? And she's keeping all of her millions because she had a prenup. Now, I am interested in this, Chris. Why is this interesting to you? And I know a lot of people are talking about it. I'm not just aiming it towards you. Uh, because I didn't realize she was making $72 million over the last three. I didn't know she was making a million dollars an episode for a Big Bang Theory. It's the number one show on TV. All the friends made that back in 94. Yeah, but the TV the TV landscape isn't as strong as it used to be. So I, I was that's why I was that's so why when you're the number one in anything, you're running the show. You know what I mean? Number one is where you want to be. That's the place you want to fucking negotiate from. So how much is Bazinga making then? I mean, Jesus, million. God. All the lead guys make a million. Now, do you feel like this would be less of a story if this was a male? <laughs> that's actor. what I was wondering. Yeah, so like the only thing that you worried about was that they made a million. Yeah, but you didn't put that in the fucking title of it. <laughs> you just put, she's keeping all of her $72 million in the divorce. Yeah, that, that was girl, what I led with. Girl from Big Bang. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> think you're right. She's you like, we're the biggest fucking actors today. Girl from Big Bang Theory. It's, it's <laughs> Kaylee Kuko. Is that how you say it? Kuko? I believe so. I've always been saying Cuckoo. I guess I'm wrong. Mm. I only talk about a little cuckoo. <laughs> she was part of 72 mil. She was part of the fappening. Was she really? Yeah, she was part of it. Did you say it? 
Yeah, I saw it. What happened with her? What's she doing? She was she was just like a bathroom selfie. It's very nice. Pooping? No, no, no. Like in front mm-hmm. of a bathroom in the in front of a uh, mirror in their bathroom. This is not true. She was pissing. Was she? Yeah, and her her husband videotaped it. She goes, "Hey, people piss." What can I say? <laughs> She's very She's fucking right. cool that way. You know what I mean? She's like, "Okay, there's a piss video out. So what? I didn't take it. This idiot did." <laughs> He's all fucking tranked up. No wonder I had to got him to sign that fucking prenup. <laughs> <laughs> they gave this kid two fucking perks and a bag of donuts. He was back out on the street, fucking sw- waving happy. And thanks, everybody. <laughs> Keep ups later. Am I right? Keep ups. <laughs> um. All right. So that's a big story. What else is happening? Oh, the perfect Donkey Kong game. This fucking amazes me. That people were still playing the 1982 Donkey Kong. It's, it's the same Donkey Kong game. It's so beloved, that video game. Wait, is that really Wheels on the, on the phone right now? Yes. Wheels, how are you, buddy? Hey, what's up? How you doing? Dude, I'm so glad to hear from you. How's everything going? Good, man. I, I just was well, listening to the show, and I'm like, I love the show. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to call. I, I, I got a call. Say hello. Now, Wheels uh, tours around with Dice, doing a very, very big show. And are, are you appearing on the Dice TV show at all, Wheels? Yes, I just had, uh, I aired on Sunday night on episode five. Um, I just, I guest start on the show, and it was great. I had a great time. Now, what was your part on the show that night? I played wheels. I play wheels, but I don't play his best friend. I don't play his best friend like in real life. I play uh, wheels who owns the Chicken Shack. It's a nightclub out in Las Vegas. Right. So, well, so we're friends, but just not best friends. Now that's the that. Now, did you know that that's the way he'd be playing you in this? Or uh, no, I actually went up for another role, mm-hmm. and um, you know, and and we decided to make so it was a different role, it was another name. Right. So he goes, you know what? I'm used, he goes, I'm used to calling him Wheels. Let's just change the name to Wheels. <laughs> and um, that was it. <laughs> but it, it leaves it open for a lot of other episodes. So if it gets picked up, there's a possibility that I could be recurring on it. So we hope. Dude, we'd all been talking about this season with Dice. It's just so damn funny on about four different levels. Unbelievable. It really is. It's, he's just, he's back in action big time, man. And Dice Clay is back. Dice rules, too. Well, are you guys touring this uh, uh, summer, or what are you going to do? Yeah, we got, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be with Andrew the 13th, 14th, and 15th coming up in, uh, on the East Coast. And then I'm uh, I'm doing a lot of headlining on my own. I'll be at the Stress Factory, and I'll be in the Boca Raton at the Black Box in June. So a lot of stuff going on. We're going to be in, uh, we're going to be together th- on Thursday night. We'll be together, hanging out. You are going to be, at the, you're going to be at the Stress, Stress Factory in Jersey? I'll be at the Stress Factory in Jersey um, June 30th, July 1st, and July 2nd, my birthday weekend. Well, let's try to hook up when you come back east, all right? I would love to hook up with you. Are you kidding? Come to the show. We'll hang out. We'll, we'll do dinner. We'll do lunch. We'll do whatever you want. Well, uh, yeah, and you come in and do this show. All right. I'm going to I'm gonna have that. Yeah, I'm gonna have my guy contact you, okay? I appreciate it. Thank you very much, man. All right. Am I going to put him on hold now, Chris? All right. I'm going to put you on hold, Wheels, and let Chris talk to you. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I am... Um, I'm blown away about how funny Dice's show is now. Yeah, it's excellent. It's yeah. really, really funny. It's um, it's funny and it's strange and it's weird, but it's going like balls off the whole time because he's funny as Dice, but he's also really funny as Andrew. You yeah. Know? It's really, really crazy. All right. Uh, coming up a little later on in the show, uh, we told you we were going to have on the very beautiful Chloe. And how do you say 70? It's 70. Chloe Savini. You know how long I've been saying Savini? Really? Yeah. You know what I said? Oh, my God. I shouldn't even say it out loud because I'm afraid I'll say it in front of her. What? But Savigny. I thought it was Savigny no. for a long time. It's Savigny. I know it isn't that. Savigny. That's how Sevigny. I said it, too. Savigny? Savigny. All right. Let's stop saying it because I'm going to embarrass myself. And then Whit uh, Stillman, who for you and I is one of our favorite uh, auteurs, writer, director, uh, what is it, Metropolitan Last Days of Disco, Barcelona. And what was the one a couple of years ago called? Um, um, 
Gosh, what was that called? It was so good. It had Greta Gerwig in it. Yeah. And um, that one was fantastic as well. She's... Um, Damsels in it, Distress. Yeah, 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 yeah. A little bit different, but still in that thing. So this film, it's kind of this Jane Austen thing. It starts, and I, I have this like fucking panic. Like, I am going to hate this film. And then one character, because I don't, I can't watch Downton Abbey, and I can't watch, you know, fucking Howard's End, and the maid loves the butler, and all right. those fucking movies drive me nuts. But then a guy walks in, and he just starts to kill it, and it's like a light switch went off for me, and I'm like, okay, I get this movie completely. And then it kind of sets in, yeah. you know, the the dialogue between... Yeah. The female characters is so funny as well. I oh, mean, the female characters fucking kill it because yeah. they, they run the show and they actually cuck a dude, which fucking had me <laughs> laughing my ass off at the end of it. Yeah. I was fucking literally laughing like I was like watching a Seth Rogen comedy. Yeah. You know? And Chloe and Kate together, there's something like Sexually? Yeah, um no, but But that would be great, be. right? Yeah, I mean I won't lie, I did think about it, but um, key bumps. <laughs> fucking Chris yelling key bumps for every Reason. Hey, Do you hook everything up with wheels? Yeah, well, I'm hooked up with wheels. We'll be texting later. Everything's going to be great. Good. Well, you know what? Run a past dice because you know what? You got to have respect. We'll do. You got to show respect. <laughs> Chris, this is something you can get into now, you and your chick. Uh, nudists are saying that they're worried that most of them are in their 60s and 70s. <laughs> <laughs> and I worry about that too. <laughs> they want some young nudists to show up. <laughs> And I know you and your your chick love the raw dog. It no protection. You know me. But would you guys feel comfortable walking around a nudist camp and or beach trailer park wherever they're at? <laughs> I I mean not with with the, such an older crowd. I don't know if I'd feel so comfortable. Why? You feel comfortable around the very young crowd? Is that what no. you're saying? <laughs> Appro- age appropriate. Sick. Age appropriate. But here's the thing: you go around th- with them with your nice tight balls. And everybody's gonna, everybody's gonna be very impressed with you. How do you keep your balls so tight? You, you've got the balls of a nine-year-old in your mouth. Oh God, <laughs> sir, stop it! No, this is a camp, not a buffet. <laughs> It would be one of those things where it would be weird until it just wouldn't be weird. Like it would be weird at first. Uh, It would probably take a day to adjust, and then by day two, you'd be like, "Yeah, we don't wear clothes anymore." Like, why can't at least wear a robe for a while? (laughs) Just drape, but open. Like, oh yeah, nice open robe. (laughs) I like for a chill. I would do it in a heartbeat. (laughs) The moment I stepped off the plane, I'd be naked. Why? Why? I mean, you can go and be part of this. We're gonna do it. They want you. He wants to show off that summer body he's been working and then, on. When's he been working on that? <laughs> oh, yeah, bike every day. So I've been working in the winter, <laughs> too. <laughs> oh, so he's like Seriously, what, hold on. Jeez. What is it like to be so fucking unfunny <laughs> that you can't realize that people are setting you up? But the weird yeah. thing is you are funny, but when no. someone sets you up yeah. and they're like, hey, that's your funny thing you do, you completely forget it. Every time. Wait a minute, what makes you think that he's funny? He is funny. He's just no. not. Thank you. He is not fucking funny. <laughs> he's funny. He's just not smart, is what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> he's not smart funny. If I was smarter, I'd be offended. You know what? You're like somebody that to laugh at, like someone to throw rocks at. You know, that kind of <laughs> sure. funny. That would hurt. Like a best yeah. friend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like when you get in the spine with a rock, the way you yell out. That's fucking funny. <laughs> That's your thing. <laughs> By the way, Chris is in there doing things, and now I think everything is a sign, and I thought you were just giving a thumbs down, but then he puts his thumb and then just starts itching it like this. And I was like, what, are we dumping out of something? There's a bunch of dry skin on my hand. I don't know what the fuck happened. Chris. I know what happened. You're keeping it up your ass when you're sleeping at night. Here's the thing. Do you think that Joey's funny? I do think Joey's funny, yeah. Do you think the Vita's funny? I do, yeah. You're fucking wrong twice. (laughs) Now... Which one is the funnier, in your opinion? Hmm, that is difficult. I might say that uh, Joe is funnier when he writes something, but Vito's more off-the-cuff funny. You're wrong twice. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's the thing. They both have wire stories. Let's set them up on the mic and do their late-night monologue. Now, you're both over on this mic over here. Turn the mic up. 
And this time, give them their own stories. I heard a fucking story last time. <laughs> now, by the way, I want to keep Vito in the room. Remind me yeah. when I'm done with it. Okay. He's bringing them over. Don't worry about it. You're fine. I got you, dude. All right. Uh, Chris, set up Joe first. Be his announcer. <laughs> it's the Late Show with Joe Engelbrecht. Why do you only use his name then? Yeah, he's Joey Jojo. Joey Jojo. Joey Jojo. This is him reading his wire story jokes that you can see on the Interrobang every day. What a great New York audience. <laughs> is that a threat? <laughs> no, just a great New York crowd. Thank you. We have a great show tonight. So you guys hear about this? You read this in the news? Uh, apparently Jen Selter is holding some sort of challenge on her website. Don't know why any of this information is relevant because the real challenge is trying to watch this video without blinking. It's mesmerizing and innovative. And innovative. Who would have ever thought to squat and then kick? <laughs> now, tell me again that he's funny, Gail. I want you to yeah. I want you to put your reputation don't on make it. Me. <laughs> Do you ever uh, work out, Chris? <laughs> crowd work? Really? Next joke? <laughs> yeah, don't crowd work. Do oh, your okay. material. He's like my 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 side guy, you know? Yeah. No. It's side piece. <laughs> okay. The <laughs> side piece that you blow. Uh, okay. A new animation shows the immigration of millions of people to the United States since 1820. One dot equals about 10,000 people. This video only proves one thing. Trump is going to have to build a lot of walls in order to keep all these foreigners out. There's no jokes in this. No, there wasn't. There wasn't a joke in that. Okay. Either one. No Both joke. were statements at best, and dumb statements. You guys read about this? Hey, El Chapo fans out there, here's some good news. Next June, El Chapo's coming to Brooklyn to appear in front of a federal court. This means all you New Yorkers only have this summer to get a glimpse of him before he leaves. Word on the street is he's opening up for ACDC and Axl Rose this fall. What? You guys like music? How's that a fuck? <laughs> Seriously, tell me how that's a joke. <laughs> that he's going to for Axel. Than the actual yeah. joke. Yeah. Uh, anyways, yeah, Bud Rat Weiser wants to change their name. It's always been a known fact that they're the most American of beers. Whether when they sport red, white, and blue during the 4th of July or simply showing a football on their cans during the Super Bowl, Bud Weiser represents America. Well, now they want to take it one step for- further by replacing Budweiser with America on its beer bottles. But they're not even an American company. They're Belgium. That's not the joke. To follow with this trend, Corona will now put Mexico on their bottles, and Labette Blue will put moose urine mixed with seltzer water yeah. on their bottles. Now, Everyone I, knows uh, what Budweiser is. He has three sentences explaining what Budweiser I, yeah. is. It's a beverage of some sort. Go back and read it. They want to take it one step. What? Uh, f- further. No, w- read it the way you wrote it. One step farther. <laughs> Well, that's funny. <laughs> they want to take it one step, father. <laughs> one step, comma, father. You, you fucking nuts. Pepper, you like to drink? <laughs> this is funny. You ever, uh, hey, here's my last one. Some prep. <laughs> here's my last that's, one. That's a lot of times that they're doing their monologue. Uh, All right, guys, this is my last joke. And here's my last joke. And then joke. I'm going to go sit down. Uh, some preppy bros got down and dirty Hell? at this year's Kentucky Derby. No one knows the reason for the fighting, but we can only assume that one bro started making fun of the second bro's pastel ascot. Because you know how it is at the Kentucky Dude, Derby. This fucking shows you how lazy you are. Um, Vito, if you lose this, you're the fucking worst person ever. Thank you. You, get, you, you are following vapor, dude. <laughs> Show with Vito. Yeah. The Incredible Hulk needs to move over because the world's only real giant is going to be hitting the big screen. Andre's daughter, Robinson Christensen Rusimov, not only gave the producer exclusive rights to the story, but she will also be a consultant on the film. The film will be based on Andre the Giant Closer to Heaven, a graphic novel based on the wrestler's life. Wonder where they could find trained stuntmen to pull off the choreographed fights for that movie. Where's the fucking joke, dude? That they can just go to the WWE to get the to get the Yeah, actors. that's not a joke. But they would never do that. <laughs> Next. 
Little kid knows how to ball out. Steph Curry needs to watch his three-point record may get broken in 2031. That's a more visual one. <laughs> it's followed by a video. Just for the record, it doesn't say that on the sheet. I want to make that clear. Bryce Harper was ejected from a game against the Detroit Tigers after arguing with the ref from the dugout. With, with, who did he argue with? The ref. Instead of the what? Instead of the umpire. Come on! I'm a fucking idiot. Yeah. You are, and you don't like baseball at all. If you're calling him a ref, no, I feel I'm, I'm really ashamed of myself. He's right a Mets now. fan, of course, he doesn't like baseball. He took it one step, father. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was good. Following a called third strike on teammate Espinosa, after Clint Robinson went yard to the next at bat, Bryce came out to celebrate and pretty blatantly yells "fuck you" at the umpire. That's what happens when you enter the MLB before you finish going through puberty. Because Bryce Harper, Bryce Harper was about 16 years old when he started playing Ooh. professional baseball. Nice explanation. NYC getting a VR theme park. The oh, Void is boy. a Utah-based VR theme park that is now on its way to New York City and is linking up with the release of the new Ghostbusters film. The New York-based park will be opening in Madame Tussauds Wax Museum in Times Square and will feature a virtual tour of props, costumes, sets, locations, and then we'll go on. A mission with the Ghostbusters crew. <laughs> but at the end of the day, <laughs> it's so awful. How about how he reads the title to each one? But at the end of the day, you're really just in a small room by yourself wearing goggles. <laughs> oh my god, Thank that you. was the joke? <laughs> yeah. Fuck. Megan Trainer pulls her music video because it was photoshopped. Megan Trainer. <laughs> Megan Trainer. <laughs> Let's just stop. Let's just stop, Vito. All right, here's what I want you to turn the sound off. First of all, you both lose. Okay. Uh, so I, I have them both losing. Chris, who won for you? I mean, I left more at Joe, so I guess that would well, be the win. Thanks. I guess. Did he take that banana Dude, from the... Dude, that's Joe. Don't, don't, don't say, but he ate a banana that another employee had in here. All right, now I want to get around to something fucking... Uh, I got a beef. All right, you picked uh, Joe. Yeah. And Chris, you picked Joe also? Yeah. Vito, I don't know how you fucking lost that, but you did. <laughs> Not that Joe won it. <laughs> you lost make it. real jokes, and he just put stupid Dude, things you, in you, you did not have a single <laughs> fucking joke. None. The amount of explaining you guys do of basic things like... <laughs> What virtual reality well, a bucket is, or is something that you it. carry water in? <laughs> the right, bucket so, was invented in. All right, remember the last time I was down at the fucking stand, right, Chris? Yes. Uh, and I was doing what was that called? A mashup. The mashup show. Yeah. So I go down there and I have a lot of fun and it's a good time. And remember, it was raining that night. Yeah. So I go home and put the fucking raincoat up. And I go. Oh, I had a nice night. And I go about my life. It was me, you know, we had a good time on stage. About five, six weeks later, it's raining again. I put my fucking raincoat back on. I look around and grab a fucking lighter. Some paper in there. I pull it out. There's money. And a receipt from the stand. Somebody had fucking, like a whore, stuck fucking money in my pocket without telling me who they were. Right? I'm like, well, this is insulting. You know what I mean? I come down to do something for my friend, and these people at the fucking stand just put a few bucks in a receipt. And, you know, like, who? Do you want to give me a fucking jizz tattoo to wipe <laughs> off my face? Because you treat me like a whore right now. So then they asked me to do something else last night, and I go like this. Oh, so you could fucking shove money in my pocket? And they go, Vito did that. And I'm like, Chris Stanley's veto treated me like a goddamn street whore by stuck, sticking money in my pocket. Vito, what the hell's going on here? Well, they gave me, I was there after you guys left, and uh, they gave me your pay for the event. And then the next day. I First of all, who do you think I am that I take pay? Well, I didn't know what to do. Ask me. Ask Chris. You know what I would have said? Throw that fucking money back in their face. I was the only one there at that point, so I was by myself. You see what's going on here, Chris? Did you know about this? You gotta give it to me, buddy. Or I would have taken care of it or talked to Ron. 
Like, you know I'm not going to let... And then you just stick it in my pocket without saying a word to me? Well, I felt awkward giving you money, so I just was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to avoid this conversation, so I just put it in the pocket. <laughs> and I was just hoping you would find it and just... <laughs> I can't tell you how fucking it's pissed like, off I was about it. It's like he slipped it in your G-string. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thanks for the blow job, is what he said to me. <laughs> are you one of us or are you one of them? I'm one of you guys, but I just, I felt weird. Why wouldn't you say to them, how dare you insult this man? He comes all the way down here and you're trying to throw him cash? I should have said that, but I was just like, you know what? Maybe $20 is a nice $20. Then you fucking keep it. You should have taken that money to your grave. I'm no thief. No, you know what? You were, you were a fucking thief with my dignity. You stole my fucking dignity. <laughs> I don't want to steal and, your dignity. And Chris, you didn't know a word about this. I know that, that this went down. He's slipping fucking dollars in me like I'm a fucking $2 whore. How'd you even get your hand into his pocket? I saw the jacket on the couch. Oh, Jesus. So I just figured why. Can I not feel fucking safe with my fucking belongings around here, Chris? You can feel safe. Really? Because I, if I hadn't told you this story, you never would have fucking heard it. So that means I'm not safe. You're safe with me. I feel like if I'll take a fucking nap, you and Vito will jack on my fucking face. No, then what? put a saw buck in my fucking top no. pocket. You guys would do that? Did, am I the only one who sees this as insulting? You fucking black t-shirt fucking rockers. What is this? Because ACDC is touring? I was always a big DC fan. Are you really? I like their hits. Well, first of all, if you like their hits, then you got fucking plenty of time, don't you, my friend? I'm going to actually say this about ACDC. And I saw them before, and you know what I thought to myself? What? Oh, what a bar band. What a nice, friendly fucking bar band. Oh, yeah? I had no idea they were going to hang around forever. But I will say this, and I will dare anyone to beat me and show me that I'm wrong. I think that ACDC have more rock anthems than any fucking band on in the history of the planet Earth. Straight out rock anthems. Period. Yeah, I mean... <clears throat> Most of what their hits are, like, that's exactly what their hits are. Every single one of they them. They have the word rock in them normally. Yeah. That's how much of a rock anthem band they are. <laughs> They're am I right, them. Joey, or am I wrong? You can fucking... Each one, each song has such an identifiable riff, chord, introduction. When Thunderstruck comes on, you know when Thunderstruck comes on. Place goes fucking crazy. She shook me all night long. Place goes fucking crazy. For those about to rock. Hell's bells. That's the stadium anthem as <laughs> I well. Know. And everyone goes crazy for every fucking song. It doesn't end. Highway to Hell, Bon yeah. Scott years, Ru and Brian Johnson years. Yeah. But <clears throat> these most are all other, rock anthems. Most other rock bands, you're lucky if you have one rock anthem. Sometimes like a, you'll get two if you're a super group. You'll have yeah. two rock anthems. But fucking ACDC is fucking nuts to fucking top of their hat. Rock anthems. Then you look at another band like like Journey. They had it just in the 80s. DC, ACDC had it 70s, 80s. How, what have you? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> what have you? Yeah, that's it. And Seriously, that's after their it. fifth fucking album, who gives a shit? And the 80s. <laughs> I like it on their football game. Kickoff's about to go off, and they play Thunderstruck, and everybody just goes nuts. Everybody goes fucking crazy, no matter where you're. You're in a fucking titty bar, and this stuff goes off, the place goes crazy. <laughs> They've got more rock anthems than anybody. Now, when did what year did you see them, or around what year did you see them? 70s. Yeah. First singer. I was like, yeah, fucking, you know. You thought, like, they're good, but you didn't think they were bar fantastic. Band. I yeah. thought, like, when you went out and see a good bar band. I had no idea they'd be fucking hanging around and Chris would be trying to fucking drown me out on my own show. What are you doing? <laughs> Vito's fucking sneaking over in here and putting $15 in my sock. <laughs> Get that money away from him. <laughs> this sounds like the kind of song Vito could do the build to. <laughs> who was the person who fucking gave you the money and fucking had you stab me in the back with it? Do you know how long I've been carrying that paint around? Because I thought someone stuck from there put money in my pocket. I thought it was just me. But, Vito, I would have said, take that back to Christine and tell her to go out to breakfast with Jay. That's the kind of shit that I like to do. Somebody tries to give me money, I go like this, please. 
Go out to lunch tomorrow on me. You took that away from me. I could bring it back to her. Do you understand how much fucking time has no, passed? It's too long now. It's over. Do you it's get the fucking point? That hey, that thing from fucking three months ago. I want you to go out to breakfast. <laughs> you prove something this time. You can't be trusted. I, I can be trusted. So you much. dress like Chris Stanley, but you're nothing like Chris Stanley. I, Let me tell you, Chris Stanley has hurt me a million times, but yeah. never on purpose. He's always surprised that he did something wrong. He's no. surprised that he did something wrong. I put money in people's pockets. I don't take money out. That's trustworthy. You know what? You're fucking Italian out of all fucking people. You know you don't do that to somebody. You don't fucking say to somebody, here, I'm putting this in your pocket like you're a fucking valet. I feel like that is how Italians do, though. Aren't they always feel like they're sticking things yeah, in but, people's but pockets? For my eyes, so you could have that moment. Like, right. no, please. No. I put things this in your for- pocket. You don't put it in mine. <laughs> gotcha. So now they ask me to do another mashup, and I'm like, how can I? You know what I mean? Like, this, this is what I was waiting for. So I could say to Christine, what are you going to do? Try to fucking give me money again? And then when she says... That's fucking Vito that did that. Now who's thunderstruck, Joe? You. Let me tell you something, man. It's a long way to the top. Mm -hmm. If you want to rock and roll. (laughs) What are you wearing? Why? It's too hot in this fucking room. (laughs) And I'm by myself. It's just too fucking hot in this booth. But there's still, like... pouring sweat. There's still windows all around you. Like, people can see you. Close. If I close the drapes... I wish um, there was a drape here you could Steve close. Steve and <laughs> Hey, guys. Hey, I'm um, not saying you're wrong, Ron, but I think one band needs to be in the conversation. It's Led Zeppelin. Ugh. I get a bunch. Ugh. If I stand up at a Zeppelin show, it's to walk out. <laughs> 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 Look, if I called up and said Viking anthems, please call yeah. in. <laughs> You know, Norse God songs. Yeah. Because you look so fucking stupid right now. It's just, I'm pouring sweat, man. Dude, don't you understand? It's not fucking strong bad or strong set, but there's a guy dressed just like him from the Home Stars. Go to the Home Star yeah. homepage. Which one? It's uh, Strong Mad, maybe. Strong Mad? Yeah. I didn't even know there was. There's one. a Strong Mad? <laughs> I feel like there's not. Just Google Strong Mad. I feel like there's a heater on in here. <laughs> yeah, which one is that? Strong Mad? Strong Mad. Now look at Chris and him. <laughs> <laughs> now, Chris, try to really do 90 degree angles on your shoulders, would you, please? <laughs> and keep your hands down. Nice. You look like, um, it kind of looks like those things from the movie Tron that you had to get out of the way. Well, the tanks. No, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something. Chris, how are you going to handle this fucking veto and sold at me thing? First of all, he's off of any any dealings with live events or any of that. First of all, that should be your position. You are my goddamn guy. Yeah, I am. Yeah, they Special. said came to me. Special projects, dude. Apparently, they know that you're nobody and Vito fucking is the guy who runs yeah. things. This is ridiculous. They treat him with respect. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to the bottom of this. A lot of people come up to me at those live events and call me Chris and ask me important questions. Oh, Jesus <laughs> like, can you help me insult Ron by hiding money into his f- Why don't you just fucking sew it into my shirt? <laughs> like, so when I go away to camp this summer, I'll have an extra 25. Oh, good. I didn't know that was there. Ugh. <laughs> you don't get this at all, though, do you, Chris? He doesn't. You can't fucking stick with me He's this too- time. I'm with you, man. Then why haven't you fixed it yet? Why is he still here? Vito, get out of the room. That's it? Someone gets Powerful. out of the room? Wow. Vito, get out of the room. How's that a good thing? Because you don't have to fucking see bleeding? him. Why, yeah, why are you stunned by your own sweat? He fucking runs his hand along. And then looked at it. Yeah, and then looked at it like, what is this liquid that left my head? It's just so much. But here's the thing. Those guys are always in there. I've never seen them sweat like the way you're yeah. sweating right now. Maybe it was from, you know, eating that person's fruit <laughs> in, in there. Just so <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> Whose fruit was it? It was my fruit. <laughs> I thought there was somebody else's fruit. Why no. would you sit and eat his banana? 
Uh, I haven't any breakfast. I'm sweating. Yeah. It was right here. You know what? That's not your fucking potassium, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> That's fuck it is. And Chris, you know, if you just asked, I would say maybe, you know, and kind of leave it vague. But you Guess had to what? just eat it. There's a fucking fruit stand on the fucking corner I know. that you walk by every day. And if, <laughs> if Don't tell me you don't have money because I know how much fucking extra dough you're throwing at the fucking buttered roll guy. It's so weird because you know that he gets low blood sugar and he needs a little snack. That's my thing. How about yeah. me? I, maybe I get low blood sugar he sometimes. He always has a mid-show snack. If you don't eat anything for hours. Now suddenly you're going to take his snack? This you, is insane. This what? is a conversation you would have with preschoolers. <laughs> First of all, no matter what you think of whether you're hungry or not, that's not yours. Right? And you no. didn't even, you know who it was and you didn't even ask. No, I didn't. And Chris, you know it's okay. You know I throw toonies like they're loonies all day, every day. And you know yeah, you I can know buy what? more bananas. Yeah, yeah. It's fucking, yes, we have no bananas. That's the thing. <laughs> it's his. This is fucking, look, put your fucking look alike doppel, young doppelganger next to you. Cause I can, so I can look at both of your faces. Okay. And I can show how fucking okay. insulting you are. Right? <laughs> Both. Right. <laughs> no, he's in a fucking tank top, though. <laughs> he put his arm in him. Yeah. He's so freaked out. You know what? The visual jokes on the radio have to stop. <laughs> they work here, though. In yeah. the room, we're having a great time. Oh, yeah. Here's another thing, Vito. For, first of all, you took my dignity. Second, shave your fucking shoulders, would Thank you, you please? Thank you, Ron. It comes every. It comes back every time, and I can't do anything about it. Yeah, you can keep on shaving until you're dead. Look, I told you guys, the hair's coming back. Body hair's in. Not there. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so disturbing. <laughs> I don't He's... like looking at it. Um, hey, CJ, what's up, buddy? Hey, Ronnie. Yeah. Hey, man, uh, based uh, just on the ACDC thing, what, what other band do you think made it even bigger after their lead singer died? I mean, pretty uh, much you're done after that. Journey. Think- Journey yeah. did better. Now, uh, to be totally honest, now with Axl Rose, ACDC is bigger than ever. They're yeah. selling and out the fucking new- giant countries. I mean, in 81, when, you know, their first little singer died, it was like, you know, that's the death of it. That's it. That's the end. And they came back with black and black bigger than ever. The only thing I think it was Van Halen, even though it's Van Hagar, but they did have more hits. But I'm just wondering, what do you, what, any other band that lost their lead singer came back with a new one? Well. And made it, made it just as big or at least I, kept going. I think you have to say Filipino Journey is the fucking answer. <laughs> what I, now, here's the thing. They changed the name of the band. But I think that New Order did better than Joy Division did. Yeah, but they did the, you're right, they did the interesting thing of change the name of the band, which means, A, you got to start over, which is just about, you know, you have the same odds as anyone else starting a band then, right. that you'll be big. But the entire sound of that band changed, too. Yeah, they got, they did get more electronic than uh, than Joy Division was. Um, but ACDC pretty much stayed the same exact bar band sound and got even bigger. And now with Axel, forget about it. Hmm. Unstoppable. Axel is doing that tour in Guns N' Roses at the same time. In a wheelchair at this point. <laughs> I don't think it's a wheelchair and you're fucking rude for saying that. His legs busted up. Yes, that doesn't make it a wheelchair. What it's called is just a chair. <laughs> Thought I saw a wheelchair. Could have been wrong. Do you see wheels on it? I don't think he's going to be like working the stage with a wheelchair. Maybe he should. You know what? I know that I'm not friends with you guys because you're not as offended as I was over that fucking money thing in my pocket. No, this is fucked up. Maybe it's that we just don't have as many toonies and loonies as you do. We're like, here, why don't you try to give me this 20? I'll show you what I would do. Okay. Hey, thank you so much for uh, coming. Dude, I make a very comfortable living. This means nothing to me. I'm sure it's important to you. Go out, get yourself some fucking breakfast. <laughs> for once, get home fries. Well, let me just put it in your pocket. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the way I can regain my dignity. Right? That's fucking worth a lot more than 25 to me. Fucking taking that thing out. Look at it as like if someone would have stuck a dead fish in there. And fucking veto your doppelganger. Your fucking baby did it to me, Chris. 
<laughs> and I'm gonna fucking get even with both you fuckers. Oh, fuck. I already thought of something funny I'm gonna put in your pocket. What's that? Bullet. <laughs> you know what this is for, right? Yeah. Next time you see it, it's gonna be real fucking fast. Uh, so look at it now. Oh, fuck. Take a long look at it. Why does he keep looking at his sweat? It's so he's weird. Just, he keeps yeah. wiping it and then looking at it in well, shock. He's new to this planet. <laughs> <laughs> in strange ways confuse why me why isn't there air conditioning in that room i don't know there's a thermostat but i put it all the way to the coldest and it doesn't fucking listen to me <laughs> all right i just gonna say this about the banana eating dj famous name right there california don't go looking in that lunch box <laughs> <laughs> what was in the box what's in the box what did you take from the box what's in the box john does got the upper hand <laughs> <laughs> the fucking embarrassment of that when fucking Dana Carvey stares in your dumb face I do. and then you went out of your way to set it up because you knew Dana Carvey would have no idea what you were doing and he goes like this is Dana Carvey Did you see the movie 7 he just fucking <laughs> yells it at him it's like yeah these guys do so many bad impressions. Fucking Dana Carvey was looking at me like a girlfriend looks at you when she wants to leave the party. You know, like she doesn't say anything. She just gives you the fucking scary eyes. Like, <laughs> don't you understand? I'm screaming inside. Um, Renee, what's up, buddy? What's going on, guys? Hey. Hey, Ronnie, I was going to ask you. I guess they're having the old person Coachella show. Yeah. In October. And the first night is like Bob Dylan and the Stones, and then the next night's going to be like uh, Paul McCartney and Neil Young, and the third night is Roger and the Who. Pretty pricey. And I've seen all them bands growing up, but I don't go to that. You know, I thought about it, but I don't know if I could sit through three days of seeing them old dudes. But what do you think? I just, I don't well, know. first of all, it has nothing know. to do with the fact that they're old or young. Sleeping outside in a fucking desert is not. You know, my thing, I'd rather catch everybody um, on their own. But I don't understand people going, getting mad for the people who do want to go to that no, and no, do no, want to no, pay I'm the prices. No, yeah. no, I'm not getting mad. No, I'm but I'm saying go around and read on what Chris calls the interwebs. Interweb. Uh, there's a lot of people. And, you know, first of all, and just calling it old dude, whatever, that fucking, you, you can't put together three nights of music better of any age group of people that live on the planet right now. Yeah. You're going to see Dylan, the Stones, McCartney, fucking Neil Young. What are you, are we debating <laughs> this? I'd like to go. This is the best fucking show <laughs> that you could go see, period. I want to go. Do I have to camp out? <laughs> That's the problem. You got to like fucking there's... sleep out there? Is there a hotel room? There's hotels in the surrounding area, but I'm sure they're already sold out. Right. Maybe Airbnb it. Well, can I get some kind of a really classy tent? Yes. I don't, I don't have any time with that. But I don't understand why other people get mad about it, you know? People enjoy it. I think they're getting $7 million a piece or something. Yeah, each act is getting $7 million. That's good money. But then they put that in the pocket. Like they Let me <laughs> slip in. Why nice cool a fucking seven million. $7 million show? Fucking slip it in my pocket. <laughs> I'd be laughing the whole time I was fucking singing. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. <laughs> I can buy anything I want now. <laughs> I'm literally above the wall. Well, hey, everybody, it's Bob Dylan. I sing like this now. Lay, lay, de, lay. <laughs> um, Bob, are you doing a Kermit impression, or did you want to <laughs> sing a song? Why does he sing like that and on that And he never song? did again. <laughs> if, you, if you went and saw him at, at, in concert after that, he's like, lay, lay, de, lay. Lay, come, he, me, be, Why did he do it like that, that one song? Who knows? He fucking probably just... Heard some country and western artists on the way in. Just started. You I'm know, gonna going, do that. I could do that. Yeah. Uh, Boomer's mom said I could use a new job, Ron. 
I could go through your pockets looking for cash. Firing people who put it there. Uh, Ryan said, Journey with the Impressionist lead singer plays to have the crowd Steve Perry Journey played to. Have the crowds. They're right. Have. I'm sure they mean something like half. <laughs> Chris, let me know when our guests are going to be here. Should be here in five minutes. What did he say before the five minutes? Schmarner, Schmarner, five minutes. Schmarner, Schmarner, five minutes. Schmarner, Schmarner, five Schmarner, minutes. Schmarner. Do we have to break then? Or? Yeah, then we should break before they come in. Chris. Yes, Ron. You. <laughs> <laughs> I like you better in the hot house. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I feel crazy. You're gonna here. lose so much water weight in there. That's cool. Yeah, that's you're the best definitely thing gonna make, make weight for the big crying. fight. <laughs> <laughs> make weight to fight Vito. <laughs> I don't know if he could do that. <laughs> ah, Vito's running around trying to lose sauce. <laughs> <laughs> All this sauce weight. He still doesn't fu- fucking Vito. Still doesn't get that he insulted me. No, he doesn't. He's going to make it up to you. And I want to make it up to you, too, as because of, you know, the doppelganger no, This thing. can't be fucking made up to me for two reasons. Number one, Christine feels like she got away f- with this for six weeks, right? <laughs> six weeks, she'd been laughing behind my back. Probably her and Big J lay- sitting in bed at night. Going, you believe he took that fucking 25? What a piece of garbage. They better not be fucking saying that. And what else would they be saying? You know what? In their reality, they were right. We're going to make them wrong. How, Chris? You don't have a fucking plan. You're like Donald Trump. You say stuff and then expect we'll us to We'll make Ron great it. again. <laughs> they have actually came up with Trump doesn't have one concrete fucking plan for anything. Don't worry about it. He's going to get all the right people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, why don't we take a break here, Chris? Who are we coming back with? Miss Chloe Seventy and Whit Stillman. Love them. Love. I'm so excited. New movie is rolling out soon. Love and Friendship, which I think is this Friday. May 13th. Yeah. I might go back and see this in the theater. Uh, I was thinking about doing the same, actually. Really? Yeah. So you copied every fucking idea I have. I mean, now maybe... Uh, you can treat us with that 25. That 25 got burnt. <laughs> I fucking lit it on fire, and I used that money to light someone's house on fire. <laughs> so hopefully it traces back to the stand people. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. Bennington. Whit Stillman and Chloe Sevney are in studio with us. The film is Love and Friendship. It comes out in select theaters Friday, May 13th. Congratulations on it. Uh, the film is incredibly funny. How much of that has to do with Jane Austen's original text and how much of it is adaptation? Well, I think about two thirds of it is the Jane Austen original. Um, it, our film, Love and Friendship, is based on a novella normally, um, referred to as Lady Susan, although that wasn't her title. And, um, there's a very funny sort of thread through the whole film with, um, Chloe Sevigny's character, Alicia, playing with Kate Beckinsale's character, Lady Susan, and they are sort of the engine of the whole film. But Jane Austen really had letters between the women. And not so much between the men. So sort of the, the male side is new. And we had some very funny, um, comic actors from England doing that side of it. So it gave it kind of an interesting balance between sort of British sketch comedy, sort of guy stuff and these, this wonderful friendship between the two women. Yeah, the comedy really shines through, but I think it's interesting because drama tends to be timeless uh, war and heartbreak and uh, tragedy but often you know comedy can uh, be outdated and yet this feels really present um, particularly your character um, and uh, the, the main character Lady Susan both I think it feels very modern your conversations yeah I think you know it's it's a female driven story and I feel like um, 
this relationship, I think most women could relate to, no matter your age, you know, from teenagers to, you know, older women could, could relate to this friendship between these two ladies and the way Wit directs the film and the way we're just kind of like delivering everything very dry and very earnest and, you know, and the pace at which he edits it keeps it really fresh and fun and moves along in a really quick clip. And, um, yeah. But it's interesting you say that because you say that's very fresh and contemporary and that's precisely the Jane Austen. Mm-hmm. And those are really, those are Jane Austen lines, the really funny ones, like facts are horrid things and, and it's a pity you married Mr. Johnson, uh, too old to be governable, too young to die, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on like that. There are a lot of those. <laughs> it's particularly funny when you think that the conversation of are women funny is still a conversation when <clears throat> Jane Austen existed. Jane, yeah, <laughs> yeah. When Jane Austen was already doing it. But I always think that it's, uh, that it's fun when you can't trust what people are saying to each other. Yes. They're saying one thing, exactly. but then uh, as an audience member, you have to sit there and go, okay, this is what's really happening. That's yes. probably why it took me about 10 or 15 minutes before I felt like I could catch my balance with yeah. the film. Yeah, I think it's much better when things are a puzzle and, and things aren't, aren't what, 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 what they seem or are being said. Mm. And, of course, in that kind of society rules, and you've done that with your other film, but there are rules to being in a society, and that's for us to catch up as audience members as well, to yes. try to figure out where it's at. Yes. I think, I think it's nice to, let, to give yourself over to it. I mean, you yeah. know, it's like really real entertainment in that sense, you know, to enter this world and just give yourself over to it and and join in these these people's lives. Sure. It's so much fun to go on that to go on that ride. Well, we forget that that was always the way if you watched a Kubrick film. Mm-hmm. It always felt like you would start in a cement mixer before you could find yourself. And um and I think that that's what an audience kind of wants to do. It's tougher and tougher to find those kind of films that you can go out, feel a little challenged by, go out later and discuss it with your friends. Yeah, there, the the film is, um, you know, the text, obviously, the, the dialogue is so incredibly funny, but it's also a really, it's a really beautiful film. Uh, it's It looks like an oil painting mm. all the, throughout the whole thing. And actually, one of my favorite shots is a shot of uh, Chloe in the back of that stagecoach. And I was like, that is maybe one of the most right, stunning gorgeous. shots of all time. It's, it's really beautiful. Yes. Um, I felt sometimes that our film was haunted by the ghost of Stanley Kubrick because we were shooting in Ireland where he shot um, Barry Lyndon. Yeah. And there's absolutely beautiful Baroque music in Barry Lyndon. And normally, um, initially in our cut, we used um, his version of Handel Saraband in our opening scene. And we struggled and struggled to find some non-Barry Lyndon music that would work there. And I finally found um, Purcell's um, funeral march for Queen Mary, and we put it in, and we finally got it to work. We're so happy we didn't have Fondel Saraband anymore. <laughs> and then we premiere the movie, and then the film buff starts saying, "Oh, you're you're using that uh, Stanley Kubrick in the opening. That's really great." And I said, "No, no, we don't know. <laughs> we took that out." Uh, and say, "No, no, he used it in Clockwork Orange." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what's the process like um, working with someone else's material when you're adapting it? Do you feel um, more pressure and responsibility? Well, um, this was really good in the sense that we had the total freedom of not having sort of contracts and options since her work is in the public domain. So sometimes when you buy a novel to adapt that's a, a contemporary novel, you have like two years of options and you have to buy it. So if you don't get the script done in time, you lose the, the book. You also sometimes get um, authors who prefer that a more important, prestigious, fashionable director directs their movie. So they sort of swoop in and sort of take it away from you, which happened to me once, which wasn't a very pleasant experience. And Jane Austen was just impeccable in not interfering at all. She just <laughs> she that held back. She's me. good that way. And so it did take a long time of trying to... There's such funny material. I mean, she didn't really complete this um, novella the way she'd complete a normal work that she was going to publish. It's, it's a bit of a mess in this epistolary format of letters back and forth. But the sentences and paragraphs in it include her best writing that's really funny beautiful sentences and so he was like mining gems or gold and yeah. just putting them in the right context and then getting actors like chloe 70 to play it 
And for you, uh, as he said, that the, there's a very big difference. There's kind of this very broad comedy in some moments. Um, but for you, your character, there's a lot of subtlety and restraint. How did you find that that rapport that you had there? I mean, for me, it was all on on the page and when Wits and Jane's <laughs> writing. <laughs> it was so rich and just the, you know, the conversation, the banter between Kate and I just kind of tried to keep it as real as possible for people to relate to it and keep it as fresh as possible. And and Kate is so funny in the movie She's and great. so great charming. Yeah. And she was just so fun to watch and her command of the language and, you know, just being on set with these amazing actors and watching them have so much fun with the material and in these amazing costumes and these beautiful houses in Dublin. And it was just so fun to be on set and, and be around these great actors. Yeah, but so, so, I also love the fact that there's this, this fear of being shipped off to Connecticut, <laughs> which all of us in New York City have all the time. <laughs> Please don't send me yeah. to Connecticut. Hard first. Well, I grew up in Connecticut, so it's even more personal, I guess. <laughs> But you were saying about, you know, working with the costume, how much of that is important to getting, uh, particularly when you're working with a different time period, because you, you're going to be relying so much on, on the outside world. Well, it totally, you. you know, dictates how you move and how you carry yourself. And it's just easier to immerse yourself in the world and, and to jump into it. And, you know, in the corset, to the volume of the dresses, to the hair. And it's just, you know... You Were those comfort. uncomfortable? Were those dresses uncomfortable? Well, I don't think so. No, I don't mind the course about it. You know. Was there a lot of back and forth with the designer? Like, did they just present a dress and you loved it? Or did you sometimes say, I don't want to wear that? Um, I, I always give the costume designers a hard time on movies. Do you? I, well, I love fashion and, and I wanted my costumes to be as authentic as possible. And so I kept saying, oh, more buttons, more lace, more. I just wanted it to be as thought, delicate I, and intricate as possible. I, I thought Chloe's, um, Dresses were particularly beautiful. They were so <laughs> they're so cheerful and so bright and so fantastic. I don't know. It's a great period. We See, I liked the it. muted, pretty dresses of like Emma. I really liked yours. I think we should go back to the 18th century. We should right now. No, Emma, the actress. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I know. I'm, but I think we should go back to those fashions. We all have to dress up. But Sorry it's, to dress this way. It's interesting that we don't make a lot of American movies about the same time period i mean if you think of the amount of of films that we've done in this country and how few have been on like the founding fathers or anything of that nature it's very very curious and the english office poison yeah Um, it's a sort of famous thing in old-time hollywood that civil war and 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 the west and all these areas of conflict worked in cinema but that the revolutionary war that period was box office poison even john ford did one called drums along the mohawk that was kind of a dud uh-huh. and so people stayed away from it i'd love to do one i have a revolutionary war project i'd love to do and the interesting thing i think about this period of, of films in, in england is that um it's really american directors who really like doing the period films set in England, while a lot of the very um, fashionable, very well-regarded British directors don't want to do it. They they snob it as heritage films. But Ang Lee did a beautiful, um, mm-hmm. you know, with Emma Thompson's collaboration, a beautiful Jane Austen, uh, Sense and Sensibility, which is my favorite, other than Love and Friendship with Chloe Sevigny. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, and also James Ivory did beautiful adaptations like Howard's End. Uh, mm. And once I, I met James Ivory and I asked him why he never did Jane Austen and he said he he doesn't respond to her and I was so grateful because I thought he would have gone through all of the Jane Austens and done them but he sticks to Henry James and E.M. Mm-hmm. Forster. But it's strange when you think of how much the American Constitution comes up every time we have a political debate. All the... You could just go into into Philadelphia and shoot on whole blocks now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Those buildings are still there. They're preserved. But Americans just don't go back to that. I think people are responding to that in television, though, and there's been more, you know, like miniseries and Mm -hmm. long-term stuff. Also, on Broadway, it's worked. Mm -hmm. So it hasn't worked mass entertainment in Hollywood, but there was 1776, there's now Hamilton. Right. Um, so it seems to work for that smaller audience on Broadway, and maybe it'll come back for, for film and TV. I'm sure they'll take Hamilton to be a film because it's such a gigantic yeah. success. Yeah. But it does seem like British audiences are more connected with that time period right. than American audiences, but I would agree. I think that um, the way that television and the way that series has been, I think that they're kind of, maybe American audiences are broadening 
yeah. their interests a little bit more as mm-hmm. far as uh, the time period. One thing I found interesting to think about is that when Jane Austen was born, we were all the same country. And so um, in, in Love and Friendship, um, Chloe's character is an American exile after being on the wrong side of the War of Independence. Um, so she, her family were prosperous Tories, um, the Delanceys, she's supposed to be one of the Delanceys, they um, were educated at Eton and Oxford, and one was lieutenant governor of the province of New York, when New York was still hyphenated. Mm-hmm. And um, so there's this large group of um, losers in our revolution who went back to London afterwards. And in this case, she falls into the hands of Stephen Fry. Since she doesn't know anyone else, <laughs> she has to accept his proposal of marriage. Well, you you're, you fall in with one of the funniest people on the planet, and those scenes uh, that that he's in with you are just fantastic, as well. It's a really, it's much funnier than I expected to be. Particularly, like I said, I went into it feeling a little hazy, and was belly laughing before yeah. I know it. Very, it very much snuck up on me. And I think your scene with Stephen Fry is particularly memorable. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty wild. Yeah. <laughs> Love and Friendship comes out in theaters Friday, May 13th. And, uh, you know, when you're talking about Connecticut, that's kind of the, you know, from that point up, it's New England. I still feel like we have the English influence in this country. Yeah. A lot of those same people after the Revolutionary War during headed up to Canada. Yes. So there's an amazing... Halifax. Yeah, there's amazing history there. Yes. Uh, and they're very aware of it. The yeah. sort of descendants of the Tories, the Tory losers. Yeah, so there's an incredible amount of history and connection between all of our countries that those stories still need to be told, I yeah. think. Yeah. Uh, so do you think you'll stay in this direction, Win, or have Well, I have one other, um, I have one other uh, Jane Austen project, and I'm sort of tempted to try to have some of the characters from this one reappear. Mm-hmm. Be nice to see Chloe again. Be nice to see Sir James Martin again. Um, but I don't want to do that right away. Chloe and I have a series we've been working on. Um, it's called The Cosmopolitans, and there's one pilot done, and I'm writing these scripts now, and I hope that that'll continue. And um, it was on the Cosmopolitans that I sort of learned this thing that you can actually write new scenes and change things on set. Right. So I've been sort of stuck into just using the script as the Bible. But um, the Amazon executives came and said, can we have more scenes with Chloe? Can we see more Chloe? Why isn't there more Chloe? So I put sort of two scenes together and you know, wrote it at 4 a.m. And it was my favorite scene in... Um, in the pilot, Chloe and an actress from the South talking about the Civil War. And then, so when little things happen in our set, do you mind my mentioning the, the sort of... No, that's fine. Chloe at some point had a mysterious eye infection or red eyes and, and her eyes watering. And so we were wondering, how, what are we going to do? And then because Mr. the respectable Mr. Johnson, played by C.N. Fry, was oppressing her and criticizing her and threatening her with going back to Hartford, we just added like a line about, you know, Mr. Johnson keeps threatening me. I can't <laughs> take it anymore. And it just fit right into it. <laughs> you were so teary-eyed. <laughs> Yeah, those are fantastic scenes. Well, you know, best of luck with his gout next time. That's the important thing. <laughs> yes, his gout. I hope uh, I hope that ends more favorably. Well, thank you guys so much for being in. It's just great. And Can I mentioned that the yeah. film, um, so we start in the big cities on, on New York and Los Angeles on the 13th, then more cities on the 20th, and then nationwide big time on the 27th. Thank you so much. We'll see you guys next time coming through. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, that was very, very uh, cool. That very, was very, great. Yeah, it was great, man. That, I really liked them a lot. Yeah, that was awesome. Can't I, wait for everybody to see this movie. I'm going to go back and see it in the theater. I've decided yeah. why we sat around and talked about it. I would really like to see it again. And because uh, it's also really beautiful, too. I mean, it's funny and there's great dialogue, but I'm going to be embarrassed about something. I didn't notice how beautiful it was because I was laughing so hard like a little kid. And then that, I was laughing at also the fact that I didn't think I was going to get into the movie. And see it as a comedy. Yeah, because for you, you normally uh, you don't go in for the. Uh, I don't upstairs, downstairs, and all that kind of stuff. I yeah. don't do it. I just don't. I tried to get you on the downtown. By the way, is Chloe so incredibly beautiful and hip and? She's great. 
She is so great. She's very cool. She's so stylish. By the way, she was just like, kept clocking my sunglasses and I felt very complimented, even though she didn't say they were good. She just kept looking at them and I was like, yeah. Why didn't you just pick them up and put them on? I should have like, oh, these old things. (laughs) Oh, okay. (laughs) You should have fought for your style too because she started with downtown style. Now she's just straight fashion. Mm -hmm. But, uh, She came in. I was almost start laughing too hard. She was eating a half a banana, and Chris had stole <laughs> a banana from Joe today. So I'm like, if Joe sees her eating the banana, I hope he doesn't start accusing. I was thinking, did Chris give her another one of Joe's? <laughs> now, first of all, you know that wouldn't happen. Chris doesn't share no, anything. He does not share. Uh uh-uh. uh You know, like when you go and like everyone orders different things, and people are yeah. trying. We're still in the place of conversation. Like, oh, Joe, is that good? Let me let me try a bite of that. Mm-hmm. And then you look up, and Chris has already finished before he has offered a bite. By the way, my uh, friend um, Leslie says, "Funniest movie of the year." Really? Yeah. No, it was it was very funny, and that was so unexpected too. By the way, she saw X Men that has Oscar X Men Apocalypse. Oscar Isaac is Apocalypse spiced, mm-hmm. and then we sat around and said, "Are you happy, Oscar, that you sold your soul so soon?" Because just when you got around to interesting us, right? Yes, you we- just go for the big giant franchise movies one after another. He's in he's in Star he's in Star Wars and comic books. He's never, he's, this is the rest of his career. You know what I said to him? What's that? Who will save your soul? Everyone save your own. I never understood what she was saying that part. I don't know where she was going. Who will save? That's pretty good. She has That's like two good. different, yeah. two different weird voices. Yeah. Like there's that one, like the no no no, and then. Maybe it's the Lay Lady Lay voice that she's doing. She is doing her own Alaskan version of Lay Lady Lay voice. But, you know, what Stillman is so brilliant. And, you know, he doesn't make movies at a pace that, you know, he makes movies at his own pace is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. But now it seems like he's back. But Chloe is his muse, it seems to be. Yeah. He adores her for good reason. I adore her. Yeah. So you think maybe... You and Wit could be best friends. I was thinking that, seriously. Yeah. And I was wondering if he would pick up on it, but it didn't seem like it. It was almost like, I'm not sure I even like this dude. <laughs> I kind of got that. <laughs> I don't care for him. <laughs> Seems a little sloppy. He's not bourgeois now. <laughs> He's, he loves the bourgeois, like all of his films. Well, yeah, what is your favorite film of his? I would probably say Last Days of Disco. Mine is Metropolitan. Love it. Yeah. And when I say I love it, I'm not even kidding. I've seen that movie six, seven times. It's really great. Yeah. Now, I like Last Days of Disco very much. But I want to emphasize how much I love (laughs) Metropolitan. And now I love this movie, too. Yeah, but all of them them have to do with young socialites. I know. Upwardly mobile. See, in my world, I never had that kind of social responsibility but i guess i did it just to seem it to me you know what i mean right it's only when you kind of step back and look at somebody else's the way their society functions that you're when you have a middle to lower uh society thing when you're younger right you don't realize that you're expected to do things but yes you are you definitely are yeah you know what i mean like there's certain things that seem natural to me that maybe wouldn't be natural to most people. And there are so many of those world, like little communities and worlds out there that exist that you have no idea that they have their own, you know, social norms and their own little system that they've set up that would be completely foreign to you. Like there was a thing that we never stole from each other or each other's families. But if anybody I know stole outside of that, I didn't sit in a lot of judgment. Right. <laughs> Just Not like, at hey, all. I'm just like, what are you going to do? He's kind of a fucked up guy. He made some money. Took his hustle on. Yeah. But they, um, a friend of mine was dating this girl who she was kind of like a, a socialite within this very like well-educated, affluent community. But it was all um, young, like black 
uh, politicians' kids, like Howard University type kids. Yeah, so yeah. they were, and they had their there's own, a lot of like, pressure on them, almost like debutante balls, yeah. and it was like a very weird thing for him because he was like, man, I. Sh- don't fit into this world at all. And I, he could just feel the parents were like, why would you go outside of this community when we've like set you up this way? And it, I know. it, it seemed very Victorian the way, right. you know, her, her upbringing was, but this was just like, uh, in Virginia, this is just outside of DC. So, well, you know, when, uh, Jack Lemon's kid came in for, uh, I think it was a taste of lemon. Is that the name of his book? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he said, when we moved, uh, to Connecticut, and he said these people just took us in and made us feel part of it. And I was like, I've never felt that way anyway. You know what I mean? But I guess it's built around you know a country club and all that type yeah. of thing. And I'm like, I can't even re- relate. I don't even know my fucking neighbor. <laughs> and I'm you know I'm in a Manhattan apartment. It's it's weird too how much uh, that I'm a lone of, wolf. Yeah, you are. You know what I mean, I like to run. You know, but there are a lot of people who get hung up in that. What will the neighbors think? What will the who do you think the most lone wolf person we know is out of everybody that we know in that comes through here that comes, you know, either we have them as regular guests or can I throw out Earl? Earl's a lone wolf, except for one person is his constant and he's doing a podcast with her now, Lily. Oh, Lily's God. foods. Here's Lily's the thing. Food. But yes, he is much. He's kind he is of, a, you know. He is a lone wolf, but he does enjoy a little one-on-one conversation. He's in and out of, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I don't think it's a. Because I have had, you know, kind of long conversations with Earl. He seems to like a one-on-one conversation. He's not terribly comfortable when it's like a big group. I would say David Tell is a lone wolf, very respected by people. Yeah. But I don't know if anyone feels like me and David Tell are the guys. Like, even people who feel friendly with them are, like, pretty excited that David Tell is going to be coming into the club or whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't know if they know him as much as they know other people. That's just my perception. A lot of people who are very driven are just like that. Well, they're like, I have this focus, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. Well, I'll say this. Donald Trump is always saying, I have friends in Wisconsin who say, and he's lying every time he says that. I know he doesn't have friends. Yeah, he probably has a couple business associates, people who he's had lunch with a couple years ago. Because he's not getting information. He's just lying. When he's saying, I have friends and they're very upset with Hillary Clinton. I know that he's just making that up. He doesn't (laughs) fucking really have friends like that. Now, Joe runs in a pack. He's a pack man. uh, Yeah. And he doesn't even feel his own identity as a single. That's why he's always looking for a pack. Vito is also a needy fuck. <laughs> Chris Stanley oddly is a lone wolf. He is a he is definitely a lone wolf. Self sufficient, you know? No. <laughs> not at all. You're always in incredible money problems, addiction <laughs> problems. You're just the exact opposite. No. Self sufficient. You're a burden on the state. No, you're self destructive. Yes, 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 yes. Oh. That's a better word. <laughs> That's what I was thinking of. But we don't know your outside world. And then like he, as close as he was to Dave, they're just text friends now. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the occasional email, but mostly just text messages. Hmm. Even Weird. email. Even the way he says goodbye, he'll just be like, I gotta go do something. Then just start crossing the street by himself. We're just like, I guess Chris is gone. So Chris is leaving then. What do you want? A big hug goodbye? Is <laughs> Chris, that yeah. you're Chris doesn't jump? even, if, you, if we're walking around the city as a group, Chris doesn't even stay with the group. Like, you know, yeah. people, we're going to stay, we're going to talk about what we're doing, we'll discuss something. Chris is just like running across the street and he's, he doesn't, he's like, I'll meet you there, even though it's like a couple now, would doors you, down. Do you, are you more comfortable with people who share everything or people who share nothing like a Chris Stanley or people who feel the need when they see you to start to tell you everything that's going down in their life. Like I'm mad at their sister. Or to something. be honest with you, I'm more comfortable with people who don't share personal things easily. I, I, I can understand that a little bit better. I feel like it's a, it's a, heavy weight when somebody's just like oh my god i haven't seen you in a week let me tell you about what is going on what is that like, personality i don't know as i'm i'm a pretty private person even with my friends yeah 
I, it doesn't, I don't share every aspect of my life with anyone, really. I'm, a, I'm not going to give away who the person is, but I was doing an unmask one time. I'm in the green room, meet the guy. He immediately starts to tell me a story about him and his girlfriend having, having troubles, right? And he's going back and forth with it, and I'm trying to walk him. And I'm going, you know, okay, we have an yep. actual, you know, interview to do. And he goes, okay, let's talk after. Like, he was getting something from me, but I was giving nothing back. Because I couldn't even tell my best friend whether or not they should be with a girl or not. I would never right. venture out that kind of uh, information. I, I think it's really weird any time that you think you can discuss something with a friend and then you quickly realize, oh, my God, this person thinks that they can advise me on it. That's why it, it never really works. I, I like, would, here's what you need to do with your boyfriend. You're like, okay, that's kind of a weird I, here's mm-hmm. something clumsy. So the other day I'm with someone, I'm having lunch. And this person is not in the program at all. Mm-hmm. And they said to me, so what was your bottom out? What was the bottom out thing that made you mm-hmm. quit drinking and doing drugs? Mm-mm. Rhodes. <laughs> Rhodes did that. <laughs> I gave him nothing. I, mean, I could have, but I'm like... You know, yeah, that's a it's a bold question too, right? That's but it also made me suspect other people were curious about it, right? Other people that we know, right? I see what you mean. Um, now you said everyone in here. Do you do you think that I am more lone wolf or pack? Well, pack you need another. You know yes. what I mean? One hundred percent. You've always had like some guy that you were like, "Oh, I got to focus on him." Outside of that, you're comfortable in a pack, but you certainly don't need it. Yeah, I feel like I'm both. I have the ability to be both, but you're right. I have always, I, I always like a partner in crime. I have always done yeah. that. Yeah, you've been like that since you were a little kid, Chris. Definitely. Lone Wolf. I mean, I think Chris, here, I'm going to just say something. He could have a death in the family, and I've seen him do it, and still act like it's nobody's business. And for his mom's funeral, he came to me and was like, I might have to do a half day tomorrow. And I'm like, Chris, your mother passed away. You're her sole living relative. Take as much time as you need. Take weeks. You know what I mean? You were barely above intern at that time. You were junior producer. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. And yet he was uh, so unwilling to share anything during that entire period. Up until like three in the morning, so like when I found out things were really bad, I was thinking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into work tomorrow and just try to power through this. But Chris also thinks that things uh, need to be secret that definitely don't. like. I've noticed that if Joe or Vito asks something about if he and I are discussing something about the show, he quickly says, this doesn't concern you. And I go, well, it does because it's uh, we're talking about the show. It's total. None of this stuff is secret. <laughs> so if I'm saying, all right, what are we doing tomorrow about something? He's just like, they don't need to hear of this. They're on the outside of this. He finds things uh, secretive that I'm not really sure why. Isn't that weird? Mm, that is weird. Real weird, right? Really? Yeah. So that's our secret now. Now we have secret. Oh, yeah, no, shit. Have secret. Oh. Um, Everyone should just mind their own bees. Uh, who we got coming in today, Chris? Mr. Michael Moore. Mm. Wow. Very wow. exciting. Now, Michael Moore, uh, either you love him or you dislove him. There's no in between with Michael Moore. Yeah, he is a uh, he is a polarizing guy. He's forever. a polarizing guy. That's what yeah. I was looking for. Yeah, I never think of words like that. <laughs> he is a polarizing guy. Uh, he's here to talk about his new uh, film that's in select theaters around the country. And as a matter of fact, you can also see it on demand. I noticed it was opens up uh, the day that you could see it. Um. But I thought it was a DVD as well. It's also out on DVD. Wow, so, so it comes released- out DVD 
theaters. And demand. Wow. Weird. Rolling everything out at once. Um, People are making up their own rules now. And that's called Where to Invade Next. Yeah. And you can go to where to invade next.com. It's a very interesting movie. It's not his normal type of movie. It's a little more um, positive. Yeah. A little less uh, pointy fingers and more of stuff that other countries do that we should copy. Some of it we even came up with, but don't anymore. But let's just do that. If you don't live in the United States, Joe, where would you want to live? Netherlands. The Netherlands. It's very uh, Holland, right? Yeah. yeah. Old school Holland. Yep. What about you, Chris? With my complexion, I'm going Norway or Finland. Stay with the whites. Vito, back home to Italy. Is that where you would go? <laughs> to the motherland. The mm. sweet motherland where he can sauce it up. Why don't you get to the mic, you slow moving fuck? I don't want to go to England because they speak English, so it's easier. Mm. Oh, you'd want to go to England. Yeah, I thought for sure he said I'd I wouldn't want to go because uh, it goes to show you how good your English is. How about you? Uh, I think I would say France, although I have never been to France. I feel love the very food, love, I lo- the people. love the food, people, the culture. Now, do you find that the Frenchmen are as attractive as the French women? I do find Frenchmen very, but I find them to be very interesting looking. I would agree. And I also find them to be kind of cool where most people act like they're jerk offs. Yeah. I don't know what it is about French guys. I think I would get along pretty good in France. I think so too. It's funny that when people say like, oh yeah, I went to Paris, but like people were kind of rude. I was like, I have a feel. I mean, I know I haven't experienced it, but I have a feeling it's the same thing that people call New Yorkers rude. Right. That it's not that dissimilar. Um, so. But because si- we're city people, we would like Paris, but I also think I would like the French countryside. It's just beautiful. Yeah, it's and it's really food. gorgeous. And I like that idea of we're going to spend hours on lunch. You know what I mean? Oh, it's yeah. going to be slow. Italy seems the same way to me, too. Italy, I, I've been to Italy, and they are. They're very, um, they're they're kind of slow-moving. The, the emphasis is kind of, it's weird. It's like the emphasis is on life and experiences rather than You know what I think the emphasis concessions. of Italians are, and this could come across to start trouble? I think their emphasis is on sunglasses. I've never seen people. No matter what age they are, that have more expensive looking sunglasses. They have incredible sunglasses over there. And you can see them when they come to uh, New York. They always are at that, uh, what's that uh, restaurant downstairs, like Kappa, um, Kappa something. But this is a very great fucking restaurant. Um, great food. And uh, no, Chia, Chia, I can't think of it right now. But Chiani's? No. Cipriani. Cipriani's. That's oh, okay. exactly right. So they're always Cipriani's. So they're always like sitting out. And I'm like, I'm looking at ten thousand dollars worth of fucking sunglasses at these two tables. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, I sit on my sunglasses too much <laughs> to fucking ever live in Italy. I know they're. They all have fantastic. When I went there, the first thing I was like, man, these look like shit. I need to buy some really good sunglasses. But having said that, I think if I could live anywhere, it would be China. I like the idea of there being so strange, you know, just the exact opposite of what Vita was talking about. And I like the idea of living under, you know, a regime that is weird and you've, you got to kind of fight back against a little bit. You know? I, uh, I had a friend who, who moved to China. We thought he was crazy. We just right. were like, he visited there for a little bit. He was there for maybe a couple weeks. He was kind of learning the language. And then from there he just went, like, okay, that's it. I'm moving to China. And we're like, this is crazy. Like, he was like, I'm going to make art out there. I think it's a better place to do that. Uh, as far as, you know, food, shelter, these things are so incredibly inexpensive. He liked the culture. In China, it's very cheap to live? Yes. He said you could have a fantastic meal for 3 $4 American. Like, an incredible meal. See... People always talk to me. They're saying, when you do retire, don't retire in the United States. Your money will get so much fucking play somewhere else. And I'll be like, then I'll be like somewhere else. And they're like, as long as you're close to an airport, you know, you stayed in America. Because, you know, 
no matter where you are, it could go sideways in the world. Of course. And then you don't have that fucking right of saying I'm an American. Now, when I was in Mexico, Mexico, down Mexico way, I was, I completely bought into that thing, watching the like retired expats. Right. Who had these incredible homes. I met this woman who had just a fantastic house. Like it was just yeah. like where she was living was beyond beautiful. Her house was amazing. She just looked like just healthy and comfortable. You could see she's just like, this is where I took this money. It is going to last me the rest of my life. I would, I would not have been able to live this way. You How know, much money well- think she had? I don't know. It's hard to say because she, she was like, I did well for myself, right. but she, I don't think that she would have been like astronomically, you know, like crazy rich yeah. in the U.S. But you could take a couple million dollars and live like a fucking king. Yeah, exactly. Right. And then I could probably still open up an international, you know, like comedy scene and book American comics there. Perfect. Mm. Okay. Maybe taking and, the Bennington show down Mexico way. Well, no, it's not going to be Mexico. We got to be a little more fucking, you know, exotic than that. <laughs> and plus the wall. They said the wall is going to be so high you can't even fly a plane over it. Oh, no. Oh, man. Who, who's the guy who is their president right now of Mexico? Well, he just said that Fox is his last name. He said to this announcer, he's like, and get this straight and use all the words. I ain't paying for any fucking war. <laughs> <laughs> and it made me laugh so hard. But he's not paying for the fucking wall. <laughs> You're not going to make us pay for a fucking wall. It's not going to happen. Does anyone believe? Because there's, uh, I think we all believe that Trump could win this thing. You know what yeah. I mean? Because you saw what he just did with the Republicans. He absolutely could win this thing. Now, does anyone believe, Republican or Democrat, that there will be a fucking wall. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think anyone believes that. I, I just feel like if they started to be, build a wall, people be there to fucking knock the top off the day that, you know, the first time you put one stone on top of the other, there'll be people to kick that stone down. And I think we can't become Berlin. And I think that not only that, but I think that people have even tried to estimate what he is saying uh he can build and it would be impossible it would be insane it's it's not even close to anything dollars. yeah it's it's crazy but here's the deal uh and you guys would be too young to remember this but the berlin wall okay we that coming down was the i can't fucking believe this of my whole life you know what I mean? Like that was up there with people. We, we were th- that wall had been around for like thirty fucking years. So when it came down, the joy—I don't know whether we have anything to compare it to. Yeah. I mean, it was a million times bigger than, let's say, gay marriage or, uh, being passed or anything. People all over the world were dancing and crying, and fucking people were just flying to be there to be part of the party. And, you know, we were like, I grew up in school, Russia, build a wall. Can you imagine, blah, blah, blah. Now you tell me America is yeah. going to build a wall? Not Something like- that seemed barbaric then. Then. That seemed, I mean, what year did it come down? 89? 89. 89? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I'll never forget, like, people were dancing and well, it shows up in this movie. It's a matter of fact, it's yeah. part of the movie we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, a big part of it. But. This is before the, I think he'd done this whole thing before Trump became, you know, I think it would be a good thing to bring up to Michael Moore. Should we uh, break here? Yeah, we should should break. All right, we're going to break. We'll be back. Michael Moore is going to be here. Where to Invade Next is playing in select theaters around the country. You can also find it uh, uh, on demand, uh, where to invade next.com, and we'll be back with uh, Michael Moore. Everybody, it's the Bennington Show, waiting for Michael Moore. I got a spy report. Spy report. Spy report. Spy report. Uh, this <laughs> is uh, a young uh, listener named Love. 
uh, line line, and then it looks like a bunch of uh, soft pretzels. Hmm, okay. That's what eights look like to me. On that, <laughs> soft pretzels. He says, Spy Report, report the Trump camp is in talks with a VP, Condoleezza Wright. What? What? Oh. Condoleezza Rice from the Bush administration. Now, that would probably be the hard part to get her to take a look at this because, you know, all the stuff that was said about the Bush family. But she would be a very interesting choice for the Donald. So this is the Republican thing now to pick a female VP? Yeah, you pick a female to beat the woman card. Yeah. Play the woman card to beat the woman card. And I honestly think that Trump would be honest enough to say, look, I got a black woman. It's a black and a woman. <laughs> so, you know, that kind of wins. I thought he was going to give me a mint. Doesn't he have one? He does not, he does not have one, no. Well, why wouldn't I get that uh, just said back to me, at least? Instead of him just standing outside like, I, uh, you know, he doesn't care whether I live or die. <laughs> so anyway, uh, take that for what it's worth. Who knows? But that would be very, very interesting. I would be surprised if she took that offer. Really? Because she's been out of the game for a little bit, and then also will be having everybody just bring up shit to her that he said. Yes. It's going to be tough to be with a guy when you don't know what he's going to say. No. You know? he. It would be very hard to be his right-hand man. I, I'm Look, right-hand man. I know a lot of people are saying, whoever you vote for is the lesser of two evils and all that kind of shit. But I think I'm having more fun following along with this than any election in history. I mean, this fucking blows away the NBA championships. Uh, it blew away that stupid Super Bowl. It just does. I mean, every day there's something interesting. And I saw Bill uh, Crystal on TV saying this. We could run a third party. And he goes, we don't have to win. All we have to do is win six states. That'll keep either one of them from being a 270. It goes back to the House, and it's a House of Republicans, but also a House of Conservatives, and they would pick our guy. Right. So I'm watching TV, and I'm like, that could fucking work. <laughs> and then they're bringing up Mitt Romney, and I'm like, that could work. But then I think, yeah, but the six states that Mitt would have to win are probably six that he lost last time, you know? But yeah. is there enough people thinking about this? I would love to see a good, strong third party in this. I I'd love to see Bernie Sanders run as a third party. Yeah, I and I think that he would, I think he would have success, not, you can't really say he'd have full success, but I think anything that happens outside Dude, of the... he's going to be winning... Uh, tonight, tomorrow night, whenever they're running these things, but he's I, still winning. Any strides that are made outside of the two-party two party system, I think, are I are worth it. You know, and I, I think that no matter what ends up happening with Sanders, you, it changes the conversation. This is the same kind of thing uh, that happened with Occupy Wall Street, where you're like, who, who, what did that do? Well, it got everyone talking and putting their focus. Bernie on Sanders is yeah. Occupy Wall Street. Yeah, he's literally. Occupy Wall Street. All day, all week, he yeah. occupies Wall Street. <laughs> he was actually even saying that it was these streets, whose streets, he said to me. Yeah. And I go, our streets? Yeah. And he said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what it, exactly what I was going to say. Because I didn't know what to say back to him. I was going to say, well, right now I'm at 49th and 6th. <laughs> I think the streets belong to the city of New York City, <laughs> city, state. city, state, and county of New York. <laughs> But yeah, you're right to not make the connection between, um, and then some people, of course, you make the connection between the Tea Party and Donald Trump. Both sides are anti-establishment, anti the party they came in with. Yeah. Uh, the Democrats are not uniting. They're talking about the Republicans not uniting. The Democrats aren't either. And it's very exciting. Yeah. And good TV, we if I can put it that way. shifted the conversation from we were saying, oh, my God, the, you know, the Republicans are going to take it to the convention. Yeah. And it's going to be crazy. Now it just feels like this is shifting over to the Democrats. Like it, he, uh, Bernie's going to take it take all it the, to the convention. Take it to the limit. Yeah. Take it to the limit like the Eagles. And the funnest thing for me of all, Nate Silver has had a year like Chris Stanley in terms of betting. 
I mean, he is a fucking loser. After last time, everyone was like, oh, he's the genius of geniuses. And Donald Trump did this without spending money. It's crazy. Mm-mm. Crazy. Has he spent the least out of everyone? Yeah. He might have spent the least out of anyone who's ever won, too. Wow. I mean, he's only spent like $10 million. Bernie was paying, spending that just from fucking hotel suites and hookers. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that part. Yeah. Oh, it's expensive. It well, really is yeah, you, you'd be surprised, you know. <laughs> it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll, you know. And we do. Peace, dude. You're the peace. best, man. That's what Chris wants. He says, I'm voting for <sighs> who brings peace. He's good with the symbols. Love a good symbol. Well, you know, uh, watching this Michael Moore thing, and I think you could be on the right or the left. I know a lot of people, you know, disagree with Michael Moore. But either way, you look at it, and 61% of every buck that we pay is military spending. And you know it ain't going to people. You know what I mean? You know it's going to fucking missiles and shit like that. Yeah. 61 cents. Now, you start to look at some of these other countries they p- picks out. Yeah, they got extra money because they ain't paying any 61 cents. They're probably, I mean, if you look at a France, what do you think that they're paying for their military? Nothing. Four or five cents? <laughs> yeah. Maybe seven? <laughs> I mean, I know they have a military there, but they ain't locked up like we are. 61 cents out of every dollar. Now, just think that what has to happen with the rest of that money, that other 39 cents. Yeah. You got bridges and fucking fire departments and all kinds of Everything. crazy shit. Like, then how could you even cut education into that? That's why it's so difficult when, when people say, how can we have uh, college be free? Well, what would you get rid of if you were elected president? I, I know the first day I'd sell the national parks to the Chinese. What? I like that idea. Yeah. Get rid of the museums. That's a terrible too. idea. Yeah. The museums will become storage centers where you <laughs> could rent storage space. And what are the Chinese going to be doing with their parks? Uh, hopefully gutting them out for iron ore. We need minerals, people. We don't need fucking trees. Yeah. Who do we need trees for? <laughs> to breathe? Um, I need and, more lithium for cell plus, phones. we could sell a lot of those wolves for zoo animals. Yeah. I mean, those coats alone. Those oh, uh, popular those coats. coats. Are beautiful. <laughs> Love those coats. All right. Michael Moore is, uh, stopping by. Brand new movie. Uh, where to invade next? It's a little bit of a, you know, a joke of what kind of information and, and stuff could we steal from other countries. He's ready. Let's bring in Mr. Michael Moore. Michael Moore in studio with us. Where to invade next? Playing in select theaters all around the country. Where to invade next dot com for theater information. How are you, my friend? Good. It's now on uh, DVD and streaming and everything. You can watch streaming, it on demand. On demand. At everything home. at the same time. Don't leave home. Yeah. It's scary out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A, a lot of fear-based stuff we have in yes. the country well, right now. Yes. It's, it's uh, important in our system, especially yeah. our, our economic system, to have people afraid. To get them afraid, though, you have to first have them ignorant. And so by dumbing down the population, dumbing down the schools, dumbing down the media, you have a population then that is fairly ignorant of the world, and that way it's easier to scare them about the world. If they if they have knowledge, it's mm-hmm. it's harder. Now, do you do you see that as just from a marketing standpoint for us over here? Is it a, is it a way just to keep um, everybody pro America inside America? It's a way. It's a marketing. It's a marketing technique of the Pentagon and and the, mm-hmm. those who benefit from having a war-based economy. I mean, half of our income taxes go to the military. So we have this massive, massive military now that's bigger than, I don't know, what do they say, the next 10 countries after us right. together combined. Uh, well, so it's so in order to get people to be behind that, you have to have them really, really afraid. And, that, well, there's a couple of things that take place. And a lot of this stuff, I can't imagine, you know, when I th- look back on it now, between, you know, state and religion, the stuff that I have embedded in me that's really even tough to kick out. You know what I mean? Like, it's really tough to kick out this stuff that I learned when I was five, six years old. The only time that you're really saluting the flag, the only time when you're doing flag ceremonies, right. when the church really has you the right. most. Uh, <clears throat> and at the same time, family becomes that, 
you know, it's all mixed in together. Yeah. But you don't feel that the other countries around the world have that same sense of we're the greatest. If you go, oh, no. you go to France, they don't feel like we're number one. No, the way in we fact, do. they would be embarrassed. You, I, I, I will point out to the French, according to the World Health Organization, they say you have the best health care in the world. Well, please don't say that. Right. <laughs> you know, or I said to the Germans, I mean, you have maybe the most productive country on the planet, and yet you only work 36 hours a week. Uh, you're number one at this. Oh, don't ever say we're number one at any anything. I mean, they really don't want to operate with that. In, the Germans, for obvious reasons, but right. in, but in, but the other countries, they don't want to they don't want to live their daily lives r- with this sort of inflated sense of oh, we're so great, we're the most wonderful, best thing ever. Because if you run around with that kind of thinking, you're not going to catch the mistakes. You're mm-hmm. not going to know when to fix the things you have to fix. You're not going to be open to a new idea. Right. And, and so we're, because we're so full of ourselves in this way, we're never really open to that new thing that we, maybe we should be paying attention to. And it's interesting because Americans, I think also view those other countries as th- thinking that they're better than us. I think that's also this or idea. Yeah. yeah. And I think that there, there's this idea that diff- European countries are uh, pompous in some way, or they're they're They find their culture to be uh, superior to ours. And it's actually, so they don't think that but yeah. we, we think they think that be, and that may be the result of some low self-esteem yeah because maybe at our core we actually know that we're not you know the smartest and the best at this or that or whatever we also know that we've made some mistakes and we don't want to really admit those mistakes where say the the germans they make sure they teach all their kids about the holocaust and what what their grandparents did and these other countries they, they teach their history the bad parts of the history we don't want to really get into it too much yeah about about how this country was founded in genocide and built on the backs of slaves. That's like a bit of a downer, and uh, we need more rah-rah. But when you're all rah-rah, and you're never, you don't become a critical thinker. And if you're not a critical thinker, then that's how you miss things. You know, I mean, that, I mean, I think what, what, the, what I think will become one of the most iconic photographs of this century is the one from, I believe it's August 6th, uh, uh, 2001, one month before 9-11. George Bush is on vacation, took the whole month off. And um, and one of his advisors, national security advisors, is handing him a report. And the headline of the report says, Bin Laden to attack U.S. And in the report, it says he may use planes. And you see Bush all like slap happy. Yeah, what's this? Okay, fine. Thanks. I'm going fishing. And he, and he went fishing for the rest of the day. That kind of like the way he celebrated, he's he was proud of being a C student. That kind of celebrating stupidity and ignorance and lesser intelligence. Um, what if he had actually taken that seriously? Like a smart person might have read the report, might have said, you know what, let's have a meeting on this. This sounds serious. We have, you know, he didn't know at the time, but you know, there was a month to go. You know what? Well, maybe we need to tighten it up. Maybe you shouldn't be able to get on a plane in Portland. Because it's easier to fly into Boston and then get on the big plane in Boston. That's the problem with running around going, we're number one, we're so smart, we're so great. Well, you know, that has costly, costly uh, consequences. But what about this? Did you ever think that you would see the Republican nominee pretty much saying the same thing as you, where he blamed Bush not only on not paying attention and, and on 9-11, but then going into Iran and... Republicans voting for that guy going um, into Iraq, yeah, yeah, uh, going yeah. into Iraq. It's well, an, amazing. Yeah, but 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 the but the truth is is that, that Trump was in favor of the war at the beginning of the war, mm-hmm. and um and you know he he says these things. Look, he's trying to get votes. He hated Jeb Bush, and so that was his whole motivation. He doesn't really give a rat's ass about any of that, and uh, he's a performance artist. He's we now know he's quite good at it. And he's going to say things that are the exact opposite of what he said during the primaries, and he's going to get away with it. You were uh, making this film before you realized that Trump could actually win. Most of us had no idea that Trump would do as well as he did. But your film ends with, you know, talking about what it felt like to be in Germany when the wall came down. And for guys who grew up at the same time me and you did, to think that this country would seriously think about building a wall for the way we were educated about the Berlin Wall as being <laughs> the saddest, most horrible thing that could happen. 
And then now this country talks seriously about building a wall. Right. Well, again, that's just ignorance and stupidity. That there's there, to build a wall that that long. First of all, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, if you've been to the Great Wall in China, uh, no, but I've yeah, yeah. It, it's quite unimpressive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it and didn't you can, work, and you can see why it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like the Maginot Line. You know, the French built these series of bunkers along the German border after World War One. You know, this this kind of it, it's meant to create a false sense of security, mm-hmm. which is again what, what Bush and the others were doing and. It wasn't real security. You know, every time you have to take your shoes off at the airport, it's all BS. It's all BS because, again, if you're if you're a smart person, you would step back from this and you would go, okay, is there a terrorist threat? Yes, there is. There are terrorists out there. Okay, what's what is their pattern? Here's their pattern. They don't repeat themselves. All right? Truck bomb at the African embassies. Next method, boat bomb, USS Cole. Next time, plane bomb. Into the World Trade Center and the and the Pentagon, you know the next big incident like that won't be any of those things. It will be something else, and that's what we they we should be thinking about in terms of protecting ourselves. Not all this effort into into thinking they're going to try this again with planes. It's just not but not it, going to happen. I, but I, it keeps at sixty one cents out of every dollar. That's right, coming into it now. When some of these countries you go through, what do you think they're paying for dollar for their military? How much money? Well, I know. I mean, yeah. these European countries, some of them pay 2% of their in- of income taxes go to the military, 4%, 6%, not much more than that. Yeah. And we pay over half. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's such a waste of money. It's not what would make us more secure as a country is not raising two thirds of our kids to be already be overweight when they're children. Mm. I mean, I mean, if we put some effort in first, think about this. What society in the history of the planet would raise their young, the young who have to fight for them to defend the old would raise their young to be two thirds overweight? Because they're, they're not going to be able to defend anything. You would think that would be a national security issue, that we would take the high fructose corn syrup out of everything, that we would take the pop ma- soda machines out of, out of the schools. You'd think we would do something like that just out of our own sense of self-preservation, mm-hmm. that we need to raise a healthy, strong group of young people to defend us when we're old. It's, it's absolutely insane the way that we're going about this. And, and like all empires, we are in on in our decline now. Where do you think it goes, though? What do you think? It, it will go the way of all other empires. Yeah. It will go, and and sometimes you don't notice it at first. I heard this great uh, um, podcast, or it was a thing on NPR, where uh, this guy gave a lecture at the War College, and he said, you know, throughout history, there's been like ten or eleven times where the way of conducting war, the way of doing war, changed dramatically. You know, there weren't bows and arrows, then there were, then mm-hmm. there were guns, then there was, then there were bombs, then there were planes, then there was the atomic bomb. And, and each time he showed whoever the supreme, the, the leading power was in the world at that time when the switch occurred was no longer the leading power after the transition was over. Mm. And so because we don't know how to transition now into a new kind of defense, you know, we are we are not even aware that that how unsafe we're making ourselves. Let me, I mean, just ask you this. Why do we even allow companies to make drones and sell them? Is that like the craziest? It thing is. And ever? then they go, oh, my God, these drones are near the airport. And we're like, well, that's the first thing. We're going to see a yeah. plane come down. Yeah, we're going to see. We all know this, don't we? Yeah. Everybody listening knows this next year, two or three. We're going to see a plane come down because of one of these little toy drones. Right. Mm -hmm. But that'll just be the first step of the of the madness, because because the one thing we have for our defense are two oceans. It's it is hard to attack us Mm -hmm. across such a large body of water. But if you've made it available for anybody to be able to fly something into a place and blow it up, you don't have to have a 757 to do that anymore. You just have to go to the Sears catalog. I mean, something is not right with the way that we the way that we think this out. But because it's capitalism, we don't we don't want to interfere with a business and an I you know they should be able to make and sell what they want with as little regulation as possible. Well, good luck with that. Hmm. Uh, let me just ask you a healthcare question. And I was always curious how 
corporations let themselves get stuck to that in the first place? Why would a corporation want to have health care rather than have the government run the health care? Actually, that, that's that's it's one of the great untold stories. Corporate American corporations actually don't. They would they like the Canadian system. Mm. And and they just don't know how to figure out how to how to align themselves with Michael Moore and Bernie Sanders and Hillary right. and Hillary Clinton, you know, because yeah. basically they agree. And General Motors would would I mean they moved a lot of factories from Michigan over to Ontario because the healthcare cost I, I forgot what it was but it was pretty. I know in this company when I first came here the head of the XM company said it was thirty two thousand dollars per employee. So because mm-hmm. I was saying I wanted to get some extra producers, he goes I don't mind paying for them, but then I'm more you know almost doubling the salary with these kids correct by paying for their health care and I'm like I had no idea. So General Motors actually increased their profits by building the cars in Canada because they had to, they, they, they did not have to pay, they had to pay some tax. They paid right. a little more in tax, but, but it evened out so that they paid a lot less than what they would have to pay Blue Cross or whatever. Well, you actually, uh, made the light bulb go off for me by saying all the extra things that we're paying for in a capitalist society when it comes to, like, I can turn around at these kids that are working here with me and the money that they all owe the uh, the government for their college educations, some of them are paying back. Some of them have just said, fuck it. I'm not part of this. Right. You know, just keep chasing me forever. They should be a lot more angry at you and I, too, because yeah. you and I paid practically nothing. Nothing. To- and you could drive up to the college if you could go to a state <laughs> college and say, I think I want to go. They might go, well, go take two classes at the community, you know, and then you could come into Penn State. That's right. how it was when I was younger. Right, right. Yes, it was. And, and but th- so this generation should be much more yeah. angry that we, who got away with practically free college, right. Uh, that they leave college thirty, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars in debt. Yes, that is. They we have put them in shackles at the age of twenty two, and they don't have that in these other countries in Europe and, and even in Canada where they have to pay a little in Canada. But but still, they don't. They're not shackled. You know this. There's there in many of these countries. There is no translatable word for the word benefits. They have the word benefit as right. in I'm going to have a benefit for this charity or I will do this to benefit you. They don't have a word for benefits the way we mean them in terms of health care and retirement. And and how many people say I can't leave my job because of the benefits? Always. Yeah. That, Always. That sentence is never said in other countries. Because the benefits are provided to everyone mm-hmm. for free or nearly free. It, it, you pay it in your taxes. And they always see the way they, the way that there was, uh, people in this country say, Oh, well, we don't want to be like France or they pay so much in taxes. Well, yes. And if you want to, in what you call taxes, they pay a little bit more in income tax. Let's, I forgot what the number was, but like if the average American is paying, you know, 17% in income tax, the average French person is paying 22%. But, what they get for that is the free college, is the free or nearly free daycare, retirement, nursing home, uh, uh, you know, on and on and on, all the paid maternity leave, mm-hmm. all these free things. If you add in what we have to pay for tuition, what we have to pay in co-pays and deductibles, what we have to pay for our parents' nursing home, well, we, you add that all up. We pay a lot more in yeah. real taxes than any of these other countries. And we've been hoodwinked about this. Sure. But you're right that it also, when these kids, the difference between them and, like, say, the kids of the 60s or the 70s, they come out of the school, they immediately have to believe in the corporate system because they owe money. So they have to start and work. They you can't have to be get like, a job right away. Yeah, right. And then make sure you don't lose that job. So yeah. don't rock the boat yeah. at work. You know, and if he gives you a little pinch on the ass, Better not Take to say it. anything yeah. because uh, you need that job. Which well, is recently there was an article about uh, millennials don't leave. They don't change jobs enough. They right. stay at the same company for too long. Well, that's the answer. It's that they can't afford to be out of work and take a risk or, you know, take a little less money to try something new that they're not really in the position to make a decision like people, that. People uh, your dad's age and my age and, and the people listening to the show who, who are maybe, say, over the age of 45 or, or 50, um, you know, when we were done with school, we 
I don't remember anybody saying, oh, my God, I got to get a job. <laughs> no. We were like, you know, we want to get a girlfriend. <laughs> right. <laughs> or I, I'm going to get a backpack and go hiking in Europe. Or I'm going to go go do some crazy thing, you know. <clears throat> that is that is the way it used to be. And, and now you don't get to do that. And I wonder, seriously, I wonder what we're missing out on in terms of the art, the mm-hmm. culture, the next great set of movies that should be made by your generation, but you've got to go get a, some dumbass job to start paying off that student loan, as opposed to having a few years to just mess around with a camera and, and find your way and become the next Martin Scorsese. You know, that's just not going to happen these days. And and I think, again, we will suffer for this. Sure. The movies will not be as good. They're only going to be made by film students who had the tuition money to go to uh, Southern Cal or, or uh, NYU. And, and those people come from the elite. And so the voices of the working class, of women, of people of color, are not going to be, those stories aren't going to be told. And we're the, we're, you know, they're not being told now. But to think that they're going to be told in the future, I'm not hopeful for that. But also just look at the real estate it takes for them, where there's four or five of them living to one apartment where we would come into the city and live for next to nothing. I remember being on unemployment and still being able to make my rent. And I say that to kids now, and they all think that I'm insane. Yeah, where did you live? I lived in Florida, and it was, you know... Two hundred twenty-five bucks a month. <laughs> right. I cut the lawn for the thing, so I got an extra. So I was in no hurry to find my next gig. Ended up doing stand-up comedy, which led to radio, and raised two kids that way. But it wasn't the kind of it, it was letting life happen rather than chasing some strange plan. Correct. You know. Yeah. And um, so now we've just depressed a lot of yes. young, young adults listening to this. <laughs> yes. But that's why they've got to rise up. That's why they've got to fight for these things. Yeah. Like, you know, get behind Bernie and his plan or, or Hillary's incremental plan, you know. Uh, but, you know, this has got to change. Right. Well, Bernie could have just been taking a blueprint right off of your movie. And when it first started, people were like, this is crazy what he's saying. But if you go through and watch it, you would see why people are saying this is not were as particularly young people, I think is yeah. the yeah. most impressive thing that young people are saying there's a system set up now that does not work for us. Yeah, I, it's kind of interesting because there are so many uh, left minded people, uh, people I know who identify as Democrats and their issue when they have issue with Bernie is they're like, hey, he has some great ideas, but it's kind of impossible. But it, it really isn't. It's well, it, there's there's the solution there that the Democratic Party has kind of made it impossible because they're more or less handing this thing to Hillary. And then I'm wondering if those young people will show up in in oh, a lot of them will not because yeah. because there's something fake. You know, the thing about young people and, and we were this way too, they they have a very good sniffer and they smell the BS a mile away and they don't have any time or tolerance for it. You know, so look, so everybody came out, record number of young people voted for Obama. Right. You know, and he said he was going to do X, Y, and Z, and he did X, and he didn't do Y and Z. And so when the congressional races, when the midterms came, they're all like any 19-year-old. Dad, you said you were going to close Gitmo. Yeah. Mm. That's not a very good impersonation. <laughs> no, <19-year-old. laughs> I'll teach you. But, but, you know, but, but, but we yeah. were that way yeah. because it's you're honest. Yeah. You told me you were going to do something. I expect you to do it. Now, as we got older, we we just learned the world wasn't that way. Yeah. And so we started to accept people's bullshit and started to just accept it like, oh, yeah, that's just the way it is. Okay. All right. Who am I voting for now? Hillary? Yeah. No, certainly can't get Trump in there. Okay. You know, there was this poll the other day of what's the number one reason you're voting for Hillary? 51% said because to to stop Trump. Right. Well, boy, that's a great. Yeah. Vote of confidence for what she stands for. Yeah, this is literally going to be probably a Trump or no Trump. And you've got to respect the the passion uh, and the just chaos that Trump has brought to this of just working without a script, uh, you know, taking on. Uh, it's been amazing performance. Ryan, the other day, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. it's amazing. No. Yes. It's amazing. Yes. No, absolutely. And and he went against everything any or if he had a real advisor would have cautioned him not to sure. do. He went completely against it. Honestly, I think if Hillary should go and get her name changed to not Trump. Yeah. And that when people walk in the booth, they should just say Trump, not Trump. And then we'll win. 
You know, the amazing thing about Trump is he knows pretty early on that he's playing with the house money. He doesn't really give a shit and it makes it really interesting. He's not a career politician and he's thinking to himself, well, I built my brand. I'll sell so many t-shirts or whatever the hell board games, whatever he slaps his name to after this. But he really has shown what you can do when you don't give a shit. You know what the word was in L.A. when he first announced was that um, basically he was he didn't think NBC was giving him a good enough deal for The Apprentice. Yeah. And and so by running, this would create a popularity. It would grow even larger and he could go cut a better deal with Les Moonves or some at CBS or some yeah. of the other networks. And he never expected himself. I'm yeah. certain that he would be at this point. And, and that was so telling when he, when he finally, the other, within the last week, when, it, you know, he, the, the other two had dropped out and he won that, those days primaries. He looked so sad. He was so no energy. Yeah. He was like, oh my, cause it, I figured it finally dawned on him. Yeah. He might actually win and he might have to go live in that small house <laughs> yeah. in the ghetto of Washington, <laughs> D.C. It's the candidate, the movie, the candidate <laughs> right. all over again. Right. But uh, that will be, I mean, uh, you can't sit back and look at this and not go, well, this is really a historical time. It's, it's amazing to see the small crowds that Hillary gets when Trump's getting huge crowds, when Bernie's getting gigantic crowds. I mean, could you imagine if it was Bernie to, uh, versus Trump for literally the soul of this country? It would be amazing. It would be an amazing election. Yeah. Capitalism versus democratic socialism. There, Go ahead. There's the pick. There it is. You want yeah. the billionaire or, yeah. or the guy in the, in the, in the uh, you know, wrinkled suit? Right. It's the yeah, it's the Democratic Party keeping that from happening, because I think that's the place that the country could really take a look at themselves and go, who are we? Who exactly do we want to be for the next 100 years? Um, because, I, you know, Hillary, to me, the Clintons and the Bushes are the fact that they're friends oh. tells you everything that you need to know. You know, when you think about it, it <laughs> If Hillary has two terms, I'm th- I was trying to do the math of this the other day. How much of my adult life will have been with a Clinton <laughs> or a Bush in the White House? It's amazing. <laughs> or in the executive branch, because Bush was vice president, the first Bush. Yeah. For eight years, then president. For, so I was 12 years there. Then eight for his son. That was 20. Eight for Clinton is 28. And eight for the other Clinton. <laughs> that's like 36 years <laughs> of my adult life of a Clinton or a Bush. Talk about living in an empire, right? Well, I just think I don't we're not coming back. This is all this is what I got. You know, it it it'd be like if you only lived during the 80s and that's the only music you heard. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I'm going to feel. Jeez. I will be a, I will be collecting social security by the time Hillary leaves office. This is not right. Well, uh, Where to Invade Next shows that there's some other ways. There's different lifestyles that people can live. It's different ways to feel about each other. I I found it to be fascinating Mm -hmm. time after time just to look and go, uh, well, like I said, immediately started thinking about healthcare and why our corporations got caught up in it in the first place. I just don't understand it. Yeah. And I love any of the focus, too, on uh, education. Um, I believe it was Finland, uh, their education, uh, sex ed in France. It was just like, yeah. or, or even Germany, uh, you know, caring so much about happiness, mental health. It's, it's a very, very str- Just time was amazing, it's, just to think. It's amazing to think of your government caring about caring, Yeah, be, well, because they realize that the, if the population is happy and healthy and doing well, every everybody does well, including the rich. Mm-hmm. The rich in those countries, they're not against socialized medicine. Right. They're not against these things because they think having a healthy workforce means better productivity. And they'll make more money. There's something in it for everybody when you treat people the the right way. You mentioned sex ed in France. I mean, the the whole difference between here and this country, sex ed is half the time it's about scaring you not to have sex. You know, I, I, I you know the the starting in the in the eighties, the sex ed teacher would come into the classroom and write, you know, sex equals death on right. the blackboard. And over there, they're in their sex ed classes. They're talking about how much fun it is and 
and how it's called making love. Yeah. And and how there's two people involved. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's a moment where the teacher is even saying, um, you know, for your first time, you want it to be special. You want to be taking care of the other person. I mean, the idea <laughs> right? of your of a, an educator saying that to a child that people would find it disgusting in but, this country. But for you, some like, reason. you like right. that better than just putting a rubber over a banana and saying, here, <laughs> here kids, now your mother's going to come in and scream at me tomorrow. Uh, but I, uh, you know, and uh, again, these are not communist people. When you just see how much money that the Italians are willing to spend on sunglasses, you'll see <laughs> yeah. that, you know, there is brand conscious and right. stuff as we are in this country. But, uh, so there's a couple of these things that we can uh, adopt, yeah. I, I really do think, and adapt to. And to go back to the sex education thing, the amount of just even how little uh, we just pass on about women's health in sex right. education is insane. I mean, it's it's right. it's uh it's not something that is talked about. Even in in my lifetime, I'd like to think that it has changed a little bit. But when I was in school, it was. We were really kept in the dark about what was going to happen. And, the and we're probably regressing. We're gonna, yeah. We were so afraid of you getting pregnant or yeah. getting a disease that that's why they didn't want to tell you. And, of course, if you take the proper precautions, as you, they allow a teenager to get birth control very easily in all these countries, and you do the right thing, then, then from that point on, sex can be about fun, love, desire, passion, you know, those words are not used in our public schools. Yeah, and I well. think then we, we send people out into the adult world not understanding the importance of that in your life for you, for your mental health, your physical health, all those things to, because so, that's a big part of, of who we are. And yet you're right. You, teacher says one wrong word in the classroom and all before, before the Board of Education. <laughs> uh, where to invade next? Playing in select theaters. Around the the country, you can see it on demand. You can see it in the theaters. Uh, you can streaming. It's just happening on every platform now. Where to invade next dot com. Michael Moore, thanks for stopping. Hey, in, thanks for having me on. Both thank of you appreciate well, it. You. See you next time. Um, that was Michael Moore. Why did you say hard out for them or for us? We got something to do next. Oh no, for them, for them. Oh, when you say hard out, it normally means that we have. Uh, Programming shoved up right against us. Oh no no no! We're no. He didn't even want to leave. <laughs> no, that was great. It was so uh, really fantastic to talk to him. Well, I'll tell you this: I do like French food. Me too. I like French food a lot. Well, we went to that uh, place for Mother's Day in your neighborhood, and that food was out of this world. Yeah, that that was a. It's a French spot. That's one of my. Well, favorites. that was a brunch, and then I didn't even end up eating dinner. I <laughs> no. was still. Hungry, which, by the way, Chris Stanley, being in New York, doesn't have any idea of what a Florida brunch is and the amount of food that you get there. How's, how's it go? Is it? Well, you know, it's it's normally a buffet and it's like <laughs> roast beef, bacon and eggs, all kinds of like uh, pastries, pastries and, stuff. and fruit. And you just get, and then there'll be always like king crab claws. So we came up here, and brunch was just breakfast or lunch. It was very surprising to us. Because if you went out for a Sunday brunch in Florida, you don't normally do anything after that. <laughs> yeah. It's too big. It's too much. It is true that everybody here is in debt. How much are you, Chris? About 25K. I didn't know that you were that much. I feel like I, I'm on, I still feel like I'm on the low end. I thought you were like nine or eleven. It should be around there, but uh, and Joe, know, what are you? What do you think? About uh, thirty. And Vito is a lot more, right? At this point, at this point, it's like eighty, but it started off at a hundred. So you knocked twenty off. Yeah, from and I started paying from freshman year. Now I remember when I was getting out of school in the seventies. My brother was in the Coast Guard out in California, and he said, "Hey." Come on out here. If you use my address, you can go to any school, any state school in California for free. And I was going to do it and then got caught up in a couple of things. I'm like, fuck yeah. My problem with him is he lived up in Humboldt. If he would have been in Southern California, I'd have been there in a heartbeat. Yeah. You know, 
But Humboldt County is fucking chilly as shit. <laughs> it I'm is. not kidding. <laughs> you're there in August, and you're like, can I borrow your sweater? <laughs> but uh, I don't know how or why we let the state schools get so crazy. Yeah, it's... it's yeah, what do you owe? What do you owe for your, your education? Nothing. I lucked out. And uh, somebody took care of it. Bing. <laughs> That's why I don't want to see a fucking C note in my pocket. <laughs> why don't you nice. take it for yourself, you prick? That's nice. But I am, I am definitely uh, in the minority for that. I mean, m- most everyone else I know um, owes a crazy amount. And even if their parents took on that debt, then their parents are in debt. You know what I mean? I know mm-hmm. people who their parents kind of took the brunt oh, yeah. of the uh, rather than have you know, their kid owe that money. So I, even the people I know who, um, you know, had help, it, it still was uh, very still difficult. Still difficult for their family, yeah. yeah. But then you go, okay, so your entire education is 35 or 50, something like that? Yeah, yeah, it was about uh, 50, yeah. And I've been able to knock off, it started at uh, 40,000, I've been able to knock off five. All right, Greg Dillon said, just don't listen to that guy, please. He wants to disarm us, my brother. I want to disarm us, too. I'm tired of the fucking paying for that much for the military. Yeah, there's uh, a little too much arms. It's just too much money. You can't but have all that money for it. It's kind of a weird thing. This is like uh, people who are uh, sort of right-leaning they they want their own guns and they're afraid that the government is going to take their guns and they're going to use their but then they want to give more money to the military. Tough I feel like it's like it's one or the other. Like that that right. that group should be segmented. There should be like people who are like you know what I trust the military. I want them to have uh I want them to take all of my tax money. And then there should be people who are like I don't trust the military, but I want my guns to protect. It's strange that they are under the same umbrella. It's strange that we Everyone has already formed their opinions instead of uh, saying why, you know, they're against something. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like, instead of just taking their time and, like, can we discuss this instead of fighting about it? When I went to, um, when I went to Italy, uh, I was just like floored by just kind of how their culture is. Sunglasses. I mean, they, they, yeah, sunglasses, sure. But, uh, and, and, and Michael Moore's film kind of touches on this, just kind of like the way they like take their time with life is kind yeah. of insane. But at that time when I went over there, I was a smoker and, uh, I was just got off the plane, got to, uh, the apartment I was going to stay at. And just went downstairs right to this restaurant that was just on the street and sat down. And immediately our waiter came over and he was smoking a cigarette <laughs> while he was taking our order. And he had the cigarette out of his mouth and he was like, Yes, I speak English. Go ahead. And I'm just like, oh my God, I'm going to move here. Like, I immediately yeah. was like, this is crazy. I like the idea. And he smoked, like, chain smoked throughout the entire service. I remember, like, holding a plate of food and a cigarette in the other hand while he was dropping our food off. And I was like, this is, uh, this is amazing. This would completely be thought of as disgusting. Um, for me, I think this is a different between us. I think we are always looking for something to happen later down the road. Like if I can do these things, I'll have something that I want, whether it's a home or a car or whatever. Yeah. And then I'll be happy instead of just like going to the beach and being happy. Yeah. And also it's a weird thing. You only have, I mean, certainly you should prepare for the future, but if if everything is about preparing for the future, you're missing out on this part of life, particularly your youth and your adulthood. Right. The only, uh, yeah. Which is this very important part. It's most of your life uh, that you're, you know, you're setting something aside for, I don't know, the future. You, you have to find a balance between uh, worrying about what is to come and also just like living your uh, life. Who was the, the, woman that was here that we got into the same kind of discussion with Michael Moore. She, uh, she had done King Kong, well, she was just in Louis's last thing, um, TV show, but she had done King Kong and she had, she was one of the great, um, sex symbols of her time. 
Oh, um, I know who you mean. Uh, Jessica Lang. Jessica Lang. Yeah. So she and I got talking about the same thing of like, hey, no, when we got out of school. We just wanted to hang out with our friends. And she was like, that's how she became an actress. And because she lived here in the city for free, I think she was. You know, like that rent, like the movie Rent, where you could just yeah. go in and live with a bunch of people. And she was taking like art classes and acting classes and blah, blah, blah. And it lent, you know, it finally turned out to be something. But it's very weird not to do things just to do it. You know what I mean? Like you start a band not to try to take over the charts, but just to have a band with your friends or write a play and produce it. Just to do that with your friends. Don't you think like people don't even start an Instagram account now without thinking it's going to become something, you know? Yeah, I I see what you mean by that. Like there's already that expectation. Yeah, because you find out, oh, fat Jewish turned this into a million dollars. Why, you know, I can rip off memes, too, and fucking have people like them. Yeah. So you're always trying to have something turn into like we even say in this country. Find something you love to do and then do it as a job. That's a good way to start to hate something that you love to do. You know what I mean? Like, you might yeah. love to go fishing, but I don't know if you want to go fishing every fucking day. Yeah, and that this thing of uh, America, the, the part of our culture that they keep saying, like, uh, America is about hard work. And, you know, it's just like they, they kind of put that emphasis on uh, capitalism uh, it's very clearly a method of controlling who's below. That's a, a something that's decided by people who are who are richer than the people that they're controlling with those ideas. I just wish that we could. Uh, I, I just wish people would actually talk more about some of this stuff. But once you're elected to the House as a, a Republican or a Democrat, all you're trying to do is get reelected. You know what I mean? You're not trying to solve fucking problems and they even said most of their time if you're in country is trying to raise money for your next election i don't know if they're trying to solve conflicts i think they're just trying to keep their gigs it's kind of sad all right uh that's it for us uh cool guest today right yeah it was a cool guest day it was independent film day really it was (laughs) what's stillman yeah (laughs) what's stillman uh michael moore and Chloe Seventy. 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 Hmm. Who are we going to have in tomorrow, Chris? Is it Wes Anderson? Someone and... very sophisticated, <gasps> please. Yeah. We'll just have to wait and see. Do you not know? Is that yeah, what you're you saying? Know that. <laughs> that is the worst thing you hey. want a producer Do to say. I have a surprise for a you. Very special surprise <laughs> guest. Stalker Patty. Oh. <laughs> all right. Well, enjoy yourselves, and we'll see you all again in 1974. Ladies and gentlemen, the evening is over. We hope you all enjoyed yourselves, and we'll see you all again in 1974. Good evening!